All right, welcome back everyone. Um, hope your minds are rested. Uh, so yesterday we have uh, looked at the Wilson loop as a way to characterize uh, in particular crystalline topological systems, but really all topological systems um, from a bulk perspective and how to use it to relate to boundary states and, um, and topological invariants. And today I really wanna walk you through some simple examples to, um, uh, to, to yeah, illustrate concepts like topological crystalline insulators, high order topology, stable versus fragile um, versus delicate topological phases. Before doing so, I wanted to quickly, and that's actually a nice recap from yesterday, uh, catch up on a question that was asked about the relation between the churn number, Wilson loop flow, and symmetries in a, in a case, for instance, where we have inversion symmetry. So, uh, so that's just a parenthesis. So the real part of the of the lecture will start in in two minutes after I answer this. So let's uh, consider we have a churn insulator, um, and uh, and it has the following, um, and and it has inversion symmetry. Inversion. What is that? Um, and. Uh, the occupied band, um, so the key signature is the inversion eigenvalues of the occupied band at the at the inversion symmetric momenta. So if we have the Breuin zone, um, and the inversion eigenvalues are are like so, then uh, the churn number is odd. That's something we know from theorems. But we, we you know, the question I, I guess was can we also interpret this? Or can we relate this to the Wilson loop spectrum? And actually, we can. So um, what we can do is we can look at the Wilson loop spectrum for Wilson loops uh, along the y direction, for instance. So these kind of Wilson loops, and uh, plot the spectrum for each of them. And uh, let's see how how they're supposed to look. So um, so that's as a function of kx, and uh, this direction would be uh, the the Wilson loop eigenvalue. Uh, Theta. And uh, let's say there's only one occupied band, so that all of this is, is also periodic, um, you know, from minus pi to pi in x, and also from minus pi to pi in the theta direction. And uh, what I would like to appeal to is knowledge from the SSH model, which you might or might not have. But um, uh, in principle, these uh, cuts that I highlighted here, um, uh, that these red cuts, you can understand them as. Uh, at least the inversion symmetric ones, so the one at zero and the one at pi momentum as SSH uh, models. And uh, we compute their Wilson loops and we know that by inversion symmetry, um, they are quantized to be uh, zero or pi, the polarization, right? What Jen was mentioning. So in this case where we have two plus eigenvalues, there's no band inversion, if you wish, or no, no inversion of the eigenvalue that's the trivial phase of the SSH model and the eigenvalue or the, the polarization will be zero. And then this is the, uh, the, the one that pi is the interesting topological one and the eigenvalue by inversion symmetry is pinned to pi. And uh, now uh, you have to uh, complete this in an inversion symmetric way if the whole system is inversion symmetric um, so that uh, you know you remember theta uh, of k is equal to um, minus theta of minus k by inversion symmetry inversion or c2 and uh, there you go that's how you can basically deduce that if you have this type of uh, pattern of inversion eigenvalues there is no way um, of uh, of getting no churn number yeah so this is the only way I can draw this line topologically. It has to wind um, uh, if I have inversion symmetry. In particular, let's say somebody came up with the idea of drawing this line, which would be uh, periodic. Uh, I would, you know, that that requirement would be met. It would also go through the red dots, but it does not. It does not um, uh, meet this requirement, so it would not be an inversion symmetric. Uh, flow of the of the Wilson loop eigenvalue. So we've basically uh, we've basically shown now uh, using this Wilson loop argument, we've shown this relation that the the churn number is odd 
uh, if you have such a pattern, uh, an odd number of, of, of uh, inversion eigenvalues, which are minus one. All right, so that was just a little addition or a little sort of, uh, yeah, 101 add addition to, to what we did uh, yesterday. But uh, now we want to really go to a topological, uh, topological crystalline insulators. Uh, Titus? Yes. There, there is a question in the QA. Ah, is, is the shape of the path yeah. of the eigenvalues important for any physical observable? Uh, I mean, that, that was a similar question yesterday. And um, I mean, in a sense, yes. Uh, it, is, it is an observable, it's gauge invariant. You can measure this in some way if you make a, if you make a plane wave excitation in x direction uh, you know with a specific kx and you and you measure the polarization that you get out of this plane wave traveling in the x direction in, in the y polarization this is precisely what you would measure um, but it's not an easily accessible observable and certainly not a topologically protected one so you can change this smoothly with changes in the hamiltonian so the answer is yes it's an observable can measure it in principle, you can probably design it, but it's not something that, you know, experimentalists would like just, you know, like the conductivity or, or something that would be easily accessible. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks. Um, okay, good. So what we wanna do is basically a tenfold V uh, uh, plus uh, crystal symmetries. And, um, there was in Jens talk the question about the uh, the uh, chiral symmetry, and this is actually my first example um, of a of a topological crystalline insulator um, that would be in class A three plus a mirror symmetry. So if you might not remember what all these classes are. Class A3 is the, um, is the class that has only chiral symmetry. And in 2D, uh, class A3 does not have a non-trivial phase. But what we want to show is that when we also consider a mirror symmetry, we can make it non-trivial. And um, so this thing has chiral symmetry. And chiral symmetry is, is defined as C, uh, on H of K uh, C inverse, where C is a unitary operator, is minus H of K as well, same K. Um, the conventional way of dealing with systems with chiral symmetry is uh, to go to the eigenbasis of chiral symmetry. So the place where um, this is represented by um, uh, a, a unit matrix and, oops, and uh, minus a unit matrix. Um, and in the case that we are going to look at, we want this to be two by two matrices. So the whole Hamiltonian is going to be four by four. Um, and then the Hamiltonian uh, can be written in, in this case, uh, chiral symmetric Hamiltonian can always be written in this form Q of K, uh, Q dagger of K with some, um, some matrix Q also referring here to to Andre's talk that such structures appeared. Um, the specific model that I want to uh, introduce is the following, and I'm just going to introduce it as in, in, in K space here. It's uh, straightforward to go back to real space if, if you are interested in that, um, but um, it's more easy to interpret in K space. Sine KY minus sine KY. And I'll shortly tell, or it will shortly become clear why I choose this um, to be minus i k x. Okay, um, and I say I want this to be mirror symmetric. So what's the mirror symmetry? M uh, is uh, so. First of all, the mirror symmetry acts. I want the mirror symmetry in y direction that acts on the Hamiltonian as follows. My inverse h of kx minus ky 
And um, the specific representation of mirror symmetry that I want to choose here, or that this Hamiltonian obeys, is a sigma set, zero, zero, sigma set. So simultaneously, I've diagonalized uh, the, the chiral symmetry and the mirror symmetry. And there are two mirror subspaces, one with plus one and one with minus one eigenvalue. So the observation is now that, um, so we want to look at the system that is, uh, uh, that, that is open in X direction. Uh, and we can keep the periodic boundary condi conditions in y direction so that the boundary itself is mirror symmetric and ky is a good quantum number. And in particular, then at ky equal to zero and pi, I have, uh, I have mirror symmetry in the spectrum. And I can, uh, I can classify the states um, by mirror eigenvalues uh, plus or minus uh, one in this case. And um, what we see is that at these uh, places, um, we have uh, a decomposition of this, of this Hamiltonian. Um, so let's go to, uh, for instance, to ky equal to zero. Um, then we see that these cosine terms are vanishing and the Hamiltonian just looks e to the um, minus, sorry, e to the i k x e to the minus i k x zero zero e to the minus i k x zero zero to the i k x. All right, and that should ring a bell. So this Hamiltonian looks particularly simple. It's actually um, is actually two copies of an SSH chain, yeah, and uh, and each copy um, is happening in a in a in a different mirror subspace. So there is one. SSH model here, yeah, which has this winding. And uh, there is another SSH model um, here. And they are in different mirror subspaces. And now I can already, I'm claiming that I can already um, basically infer now uh, the boundary spectrum of this model just from, uh, from this knowledge. So I'm going to sketch you as a function of ky, the open boundary condition spectrum of this model and some bulk bands and um, the ky goes from minus pi to pi. And at zero, we know we have these two SSH models. We have chiral symmetry, so their boundary states come to lie exactly at zero. And now the question is, how, and also, uh, by the way, if I go to uh, ky equal to pi, then these states turn out to be um, at, at uh, ky equal to pi, equal to pi, they are, these terms are two, or, sorry, minus two, then we're on the trivial phase of the SSH. So there should not be any boundary mode. So the only question is how do we uh, extend these modes here? And there are, you know, basically, now a bunch of options, but I'm arguing that the only option that's actually feasible is this one. So um, these two states have to um, have to cross the spectrum like this. And the reason is the following: due to chiral symmetry, I have this spectral symmetry of plus and minus, and uh, due to mirror symmetry, I have a symmetry between kx and minus kx, uh, ky and minus ky. So, uh, so there's really no other way than connecting them in this topological sense um, with, with a spectral flow. Specifically, if I was to consider a case without chiral symmetry, then what I could have drawn is, um, is something like this, right? Without chiral symmetry, this would be mirror symmetric. You have the double degeneracy here, but there's no topology in the sense that there's no spectral flow across the entire gap. Um, and without mirror, uh, specifically, there is no protection of this double degeneracy at ky equals to zero. So in principle, I could have written a spectrum like this that's still chirally symmetric, but it's not mirror symmetric. Uh, I mean, it is not this mirror protected crossing. Yeah, is not is not there. 
notice again the red and the blue uh, the red and the green uh, state have different mirror eigenvalue okay and uh, a topological invariant if you want uh, of such a state is uh, is the uh, wilson loop eigenvalue in the different mirror subspaces um, subtracted from one another so we know that uh, Basically, maybe I should have, um, and that is at k uh, y equals to zero. So, um, sorry. So, w plus um, minus w minus, and that all at k y equal to zero. And this thing is is going to be, um, yeah, pi, uh, two, no, two maybe, it's pi. So they wind non-trivially, but in opposite directions. So the question, what is the real space representation of this model in terms of sides and coupling links between them? Um, yeah, so that I think that is um, something one can straightforwardly work out. Um, I just don't feel like doing that now necessarily because it's it's going to take us more time than than we uh, we get out of it. So I suggest that uh, so you see there are only first order harmonics in this, and uh, there are four orbitals per side. So you just go and make a square lattice. You have four orbitals per side, and then you look. It's only nearest neighbor hopping, but the matrices which these hoppings come with. Uh, depend on you know where these harmonics entries are in here. So I encourage you to uh, do this as an exercise yourself. Okay, sorry for not providing this, but it's just I think it's just taking us too much uh, too much time. All right, thank you. Um, but it's it's a, it's a good question in principle. Now uh, let me um, go to higher order uh, higher order topology point of view. in this model. So um, what I wanna do is, so far I've looked at the, at the edge that's perfectly mirror symmetric, right? So I have this mirror line and I have this, this uh, perfectly uh, straight mirror symmetric edge. Now I want to think about um, what happens if I consider an edge that's slightly tilted away from this mirror symmetry. So, um, so I want to keep Carroll, Carroll symmetry, but mirror is slightly broken. Then, um, so and for this edge, we know the spectrum is going to look uh, like this with the degeneracy point. And here now um, we have um, a little mass gap, right? We have this picture because we broke, um, uh, mirror slightly, and there is a there is a Dirac, so it's like one D uh, Dirac equation with a mass. And um, basically, now I want to contrast this to uh, tilting it the other way, and. Uh, I will have the same picture because the two are kind of mirror related. But if this is a linear order effect, so if this mass is really introduced by linear to linear order in this kind of tilting angle, then you know going to negative angle, I should have the negative mass. You don't see that in the spectrum of the Dirac equation, but it's still intrinsic, uh, intrinsically there. So, um, and now I, I need to appeal to, to some knowledge in Dirac theory and it's an interesting part to study if, if you uh, don't know it. Um, if I make a domain wall where on both sides I have a gap Dirac uh, fermion, but the mass is uh, larger than zero, and on the other side it's uh, less than zero, so it has to go through zero someplace. Um, then uh, at this domain wall where it goes through zero, I will find a bound state, okay? And uh, so this is a 
bound state, zero dimensional bound state um, at domain wall of the Dirac, of the 1D Dirac equation. And, um, and this bound state is pinned to zero energy because it's the unique state around there um, by this chiral symmetry. To E equal to zero uh, by chiral symmetry. Okay, then uh, there is another question. If you cut like this, you could also have trivial surface states from dangling bonds that you cut in a more complicated spectrum or material. How do you distinguish them from the topological states? Right, That's correct. That could be additional states. Um, they would always come in pairs. So the topological statement here is that there is an odd number. So, so in, in particular, you're thinking maybe there's another set of states here. But what I can assure you is that no matter how you cut, uh, there's an odd number of states here, uh, or exactly one, an odd number of states at zero energy. Uh, so it's a very good question. So the spectrum will have one state locally, you know, I mean, of course, somewhere it needs to be gapped, otherwise it's kind of pointless to uh, talk about it. But um, there's, there's an odd number of states at zero energy, and then you can have like other states pairwise, or even at zero energy, another pair of states. But uh, that's like my energy direction. That's uh, not really any axis per perpendicular to that. So, um, so what is from the bulk topology? What is guaranteed is uh, is that there is an odd number of these corner states. Um, that is actually an important point to make um, because the bulk topology here. Um, it actually has to do with winding numbers. So there's actually a set topology and the bulk, but can only uh, tell you about the C2 uh, number of these corner states. Uh, so another question in the quantum spin hall scenario, they also appear pairwise, right? Um, in the quantum spin hall case, I guess you are asking about uh, when you um, have a, not a single, um, well, actually, um, I'm not sure. Is the question about the time reversal symmetric system or a, or a time reversal breaking system? In a time reversal symmetric quantum spin hole insulator, there's no way to gap the, uh, the edge mode. So there are no, there's not no point talking about corner modes. Uh, if we break uh, quantum uh, a time reversal symmetry, then, uh, then there can be, uh, single corner modes from higher order topology and then pairwise from dangling bonds. So I'm thinking that's what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now I wanted to tell you a bit more about mirror show numbers, but I think I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and move on to uh, because also it, it was something that, that Jen has already uh, covered, so I don't have to do that again. And uh, and uh, it's just to say in, in uh, to say in words. I mean, we've heard from Jen that there are mirror churn numbers, uh, which are basically the churn the, the, the churn number on a mirror plane in a three D crystal where it can decompose your your Hilbert space in mirror even at odd states, and you compute the churn number of one. Uh, of these mirror subspaces. And uh, I just want to add that there's also a higher order topology component to that. Namely, if you have a hinge of a 3D crystal and that hinge is mirror symmetric, then um, if the mirror turn number is, is two, for instance, then you have a single uh, helical uh, Kramer's pair of propagating modes on this hinge and the surfaces are gaps because again, surfaces like in this example, I would tilt them with respect to the mirror plane so that uh, so that they can be get. Okay, so anyways, that was sort of just a recap from what Jen already told you. And uh, this brings me to uh, section three of, of my talk, uh, fragile and delicate systems.
Okay. So um, basically the viewpoint here is um, that of one year functions and uh, topology is in this, uh, in this point of view is to topology is defined as an obstruction to one year localize uh, to expen exponentially localize symmetric one year states. So topology is a obstruction to exponentially localize symmetric um, one year states. Except for the churn insulator, you can always uh, exponentially localize one-year states if you don't care about extra symmetries. But if you want the one-year states also to satisfy, for instance, time reversal or spatial symmetries, then um, uh, then uh, you you know get this characterization of topology. Um, okay, and then strong topology. Um, if is if this obstruction persists upon the addition of trivial uh, orbitals, i.e., atomic limits to the occupied bands. And then uh, fragile topology is uh, is if the obstruction is trivialized by this. Okay. And now let's uh, give an example. It's a simple one for this fragile case because that may be a bit, uh, maybe so a bit dubious to, to some. So, um, um, and again, I want to use basically the the uh, Wilson loop perspective. Uh, so it's in two D and a very simple uh, case. Uh, so I want uh, two churn insulators. Two layers with c equal to one and minus one, so with opposite churn numbers, and I want to superimpose them. And uh, now I have to tell you what symmetries I care about. So if I decouple these two systems. Um, I can think of having time reversal symmetry. So I could have a quantum spin hall type system, but actually I don't really care about time reversal symmetry. Um, instead, I impose this combination C2T, C2, 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 C2 set T uh, that Andre already mentioned extensively in his talk. So we have a C2 symmetry um, so this, these churn insulators are 2D systems. We have to see two symmetry that rotates. So it's like, it's like inversion in 2D, uh, uh, roughly speaking. Okay, so what do we know about this, uh, this example in terms of the, uh, the band structure or the Wilson loop perspective? So first of all, just so that we have a sort of picture in mind, so the energy bands, they would be basically um, one, band, one set of bands from, uh, so there's two occupied, two empty bands where the churn number is minus one in the occupied and one in the unoccupied sp space. And then we have another set of bands, um, actually just one band, but I'm kind of putting all the K in, in, in one place here. So uh, there the churn number is minus one upstairs and plus one downstairs. And now I want to compute um, the Wilson loop for these, um, uh, the bands together and um, what would that look like? Oops. I get the Wilson loop spectrum as a function of one momentum. I don't really care which one I, I choose. 
these are the theta values. It looks like like so and then i get uh, let's say one mode that goes like this from one set of bands and the other mode goes like this from the other set of bands if they are not talking to each other and now the question is basically if they if they talk to each other um can i open a gap and uh the claim that i have is that uh, uh this okay. This degeneracy point, both at, at um, Wilson loop eigenvalue zero and pi, is protected by a C2T symmetry. Resi uh, protected by C2T, and uh, let me let me sh show you that quickly. Um, so that is at theta equal to zero or pi. And the, the simplest way to show that there's a much more mathematical is this k melee. You can use k melee if you, in a, with zero rush bar. Uh, um, well, well, I mean, since I'm saying specifically that I start with this turn number plus and minus one, then you maybe want to choose k melee with, with zero rush bar. Um, so that would be a, a possible model to use, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, but you don't care about T, but you put perturbations that are uh, C2T symmetric. So, so how do we prove? Uh, first of all, let me remind you C2T squared is equal to plus one in this case, uh, even though we have spin full electrons in mind in principle, but the minus ones uh, from T and C2, they, they, they multiply to plus one here. Um, so the proof, Let's say uh, my, my, my proof is super simple. There are more mathematical uh, ways to approach this, but, but I, I, I really don't want to scare you. Um, so we have this, um, let's say, KX Wilson loop. And we remember it's an operator. So let's go to, say, K around one of these degeneracy points. And I uh, claim that uh, this uh, Wilson loop, or obviously in the eigenbasis of the Wilson loop, it can be written like this. Uh, Miguel, I'll get to your uh, question in just a moment. I'll just finish this proof. Um, and now, uh, what can I use for C2T for the representation? Obviously, it has to be complex conjugation because it's a time uh, reversal operator. And uh, the, the my, um, oh, sorry, I wanted to do sigma z here. This is a typo. Um, sigma z in the eigenbasis. Um, so here I can I claim I can only put sigma x. Why can I only put sigma x? If I had put sigma y, then it would square to minus one. And if I had put sigma z, then it would not uh, do the right thing together uh, uh, with this Wilson loop because it should, um, you know, it should basically turn uh, the Wilson loop into minus its, uh, itself, right? So this is the only choice I, I can make. And now I can ask, um, what is, uh, if I perturb this Wilson loop, what is the possible perturbations that I can put? So I, I start with Kx sigma z. Now I want to put the mass term potentially, yeah? sigma x mx plus sigma y my plus sigma z mz. But of course I want uh, C2t, of W of Kx or W tilde of Kx and C2T inverse, I want this to be um, minus W tilde of uh, Kx. And um, you remember that was the transformation property of the Wilson loop that we had uh, uh, noted yesterday for C2T symmetric systems. Um, and uh, and now if I actually compute what I have, I get minus kx uh, uh, sigma z, and then I get uh, plus sigma x mx plus sigma y my minus sigma z mz. And that uh, tells us that mx and my 
has to be equal to zero for this to be satisfied. And uh, so the Wilson loop uh, cannot be gapped. I can have uh, MZ, that's okay. But what will that do? It will um, it will just move this degeneracy point around in the k direction, but it will not remove it. It's pinned to k uh, to p a zero pi eigenvalue. Okay, so now let's go back to Mika's question: How if you add to the fragile bands other atomic linkages that cross with the fragile topological ones only at theta equal to zero or pi? That are protected by C two T. The crossing should be protected, and the Vani obstruction should remain intact, um, despite the fact that you are adding trivial bands. Um, I see what you mean. So you want to put. Uh, so you are already anticipating what I'm going to say next. I'm going to say, well, you know, we can add um, a band here or there, and. Um, then I can get them out like this. And so the flow that I just produced and that's protected as long as you only have these two bands, only the red and the, and the green one is then, uh, is then gone, right? So it's only protected un until you add these bands. Um, I think you, uh, I think what you cannot do is Add a single band to this um, to this manifold uh, that is pinned to zero or pi. So, because you want to do this, right? You want to add a band like this. Um, I am trying to see how I can prove that. I think one would have to go back to the Hamiltonian and the representation of these states. Um, so if you allow me to reinstate time reversal symmetry, then I cannot do that because I can only add Kramer's pairs, um, but that might not be super satisfying because afterwards I'm just breaking this, uh, uh, this time reversal and only keep C2T. Um, yeah, so the, the whole the whole point, what I've shown here basically is that these these states, if I take this state um, at, at, that's pinned to zero or pi, there needs to be another orthogonal state with the same Wilson loop eigenvalue. And such a flat band that you propose, if it's not degenerate, uh, would break this rule. Um, but uh, I think the, the actual way to show it is a bit more mathematically involved. If you want, I can dig the reference out for you and put it in the Slack. I would say that's probably the most efficient way to go about this now. Okay, good. But thanks for the question. It's very, uh, very good. Yeah. Um, so, so we have this uh, fragile topology and um, I, I just want to mention um, also uh, that there's, there's uh, also a higher order uh, topology coming with this. So if you have uh, this uh, C2T, symmetric system, um, there is no local constraint um, on the edge to have anything gapless. So even though the Wilson loop has a gapless state, this uh, red and green state, the edge is not C2T invariant at, uh, locally. So the edge is, uh, what's that? The edge is gapped. However, in this non-trivial phase, you will find a pair of uh, corner modes, which are, um, again, you can derive it by similar argument as before, where we say, you know, we have this gap. If you start with a quantum spin hall state and you introduce the time reversal breaking, but C2T symmetric perturbation, you can get the edge here, you could get the edge here, but here you have M, here you have to have minus M that's coming from the representation theory of the C2, C2T. And, uh, and at the uh, domain wall, there's a, there's a, a corner state uh, similar to the, to the case of this A3 plus mirror model that I just discussed previously. Okay, good. Time uh, to move on to delicate topology. And so, 
This was the example for fragile topology. And so in this sense, this was strong. This is fragile. Now comes number three, delicate. Um, just want to make sure you get the right reference if you want to read up on this. Um, this is the place to do that. One, two, six, four, four, four. Um, so uh, the point is that you can remove this obstruction. Uh, I'll get back to Daniel's question. Um, uh, you can remove the obstruction of exponentially localizing symmetric one functions uh, and trivialize by adding, uh, adding orbitals, uh, atomic limits, even to empty bands. which sounds a little bit funny because all the time we've been talking about uh, the occupied subspace and the topology of that. And I don't know, nobody ever cared about what's above it, but I'll just show you a quick example uh, as to why these actually can matter uh, for the defining certain types of topology. Before that, uh, Daniel's question, what would happen for a circular sample? Good question. So you would have still um, two modes here. Um, However, um, and the, their location is, is determined by boundary conditions. So they'll for sure be somewhere, but you know, the direction is, is, is um, basically a non-universal thing, nothing that you can deduce from the bulk. Um, and uh, the other thing is that these modes are not necessarily exponentially localized anymore. It could be that they, have a, they, could, uh, they could have a, along the edge, they could have an algebraic decay um, potentially, yeah. But in principle, the modes as a spectrum in the spectrum they're still there, and the thermodynamic limit they'll be uh, they'll be degenerate by C two T. Thanks. All right. Uh, so go back to delicate topology. What's an example? Um, And uh, there uh, we go at the 2D system with the mirror symmetry. And let's say MY is equal to sigma Z. So what I have in mind is a system um, with, you know, it's Y and X direction. I'm just drawing one unit cell. And in this unit cell, I am putting two orbitals. One is an S orbital and one is a P orbital, right? Um, with respect to the set direction. So, it's, so I have two bands and uh, they have opposite mirror eigenvalue. That's what this mirror symmetry is telling me. And now um, I invite you to think how this Hamiltonian could look and the eigenstates. And the point is, if this is a two-band system, then um, there's one occupied and one empty band. And in the uh, Brillouin zone, I have now the mirror invariant lines, pi and zero for ky. And on these lines, this line here and this line here, there is something special happening, namely the, uh, the eigenstates of the system are constant. They don't depend on Kx. And that's just because I have only, uh, you know, this, the Hamiltonian has to commute with sigma z and it's only a two by two matrix. So eigenstates along these lines are constants. The Hamiltonian can still have a Kx dependence in that there can be a, a, a dispersion of the band. But again, along this line, the eigenstate is going to be the same. 
And uh, what this implies is that usually I think of the whole breathing zone as a torus because I can compactify it due to the periodic boundary conditions. So I know that the eigenstate at k and k plus two pi is going to be the same. But now I know that the eigenstate at k equals to zero, k y equals to zero and pi is going to be the same. So I can compactify actually half of the breathing zone. So I can define the churn number on half of the breathing zone. So I can look at the system where the churn number is plus one um, in one half and minus one in the other half. Um, but the churn number of half of the Breguin zone uh, uh, is, is well defined. So churn number of half Breguin zone is well defined. And that's because of this. So I, of course, in most simple systems, it will be zero, but I can imagine um, systems where, where it's, it's not the case. And, um, and so this is a topological invariant for this delicate system. And um, you saw that for my argument, it's, it's, it was quite crucial um, that the, the mirror eigenvalues are, um, oh, wait, wait, wait. that the mirror eigenvalues are, um, or that these, these eigenstates are, are um, constant. And uh, so for instance, if I look at as a function of Ky, uh, then, um, you know, these bands would have mirror eigenvalue, let's say minus one here and minus one here. The upper band would have plus one here, plus one here. So these are the mirror eigenvalues. Note that we don't expect them to switch here, but something very interesting is going on with the states in the middle because they produce this churn number. Yeah? Yet the mirror eigenvalues should stay the same as you go across. Um, uh, across this premium zone. And now you see that if I add to the uh, conduction band um, another band, which has mirror eigenvalue minus one, for instance, now I can start to mix um, mixing uh, prevents or, or yeah, basically uh, makes uh, eigenstates um, different at uh, ky equals to zero and pi in general. So then uh, this, you know, the, the whole foundation of this delicate topology goes through the, uh, out the window. Um, this is just one example of such a delicate topological system. In this reference that I gave, we actually looked at the three-dimensional system, Hopf insulator. You can also look at one-dimensional system. So just the, the principle is always the same, or not, not always, but you know, oftentimes the same, that there are some uh, symmetry constraints which make uh, uh, the eigenstates of the occupied bands constant in a subset of the Breguin zone. And, uh, and you can use that to define topologic invariants that are otherwise not defined. Um, so maybe um, let me wrap up this delicate and, and fragile um, perspectives uh, with, a, with a one year state picture. Um, on the level of the delicate, that's actually still a, a conjecture. So if you have the stable topology and you have your atoms, um, then no matter what you do, your uh, Vanier eigenstates are very extended. So not exponentially localizable. If you have a fragile, topological system, then the picture, if you impose the symmetry on the one-year state, looks very similar. 
So note, for instance, that I put a one year state here at the high symmetry position, but actually if I, so there's one option to ex evade that, um, actually even for stable topology, sorry, there's the option of, of, of evading that if you, if you kind of do, do away with the symmetry, yeah, of uh, symmetry. But with fragile topology, you can actually, when you introduce extra, um, extra orbitals that are localized uh, somewhere in your system as additional uh, orbitals, then um, so they are not exponentially localizable, but plus extra orbitals they become exponentially localizable. I'll take the question in just a moment. And then uh, there's the delicate case. And what we find there is uh, something that we call multicellularity. And that's uh, still a conjecture, let's say. So what we find there is that the uh, one year states are exponentially localizable of such a delicate system. However, they can never be uh, deformed to only have support in one unit cell. So exponentially localizable, but spread over several unit cells. So that's multicellular. So, so that's different from the other cases. And of course, when I say spreads over several unit cells, I mean really this in, in, the, in the sense of a deformation. Yeah, usually uh, a one year state anyway spreads over several unit cells, but you could deform your Hamiltonian adiabatically in such a way that you get a delta function if it's exponentially localized to begin with. What I'm saying here is you cannot keep, you know, the same number of bands and the symmetries deform your Hamiltonian so that your one year state's only sitting in one unit cell or on one atom essentially. It always has to sit on two. All right, um, now uh, let's go through the question. Is it changing the shape of the one-year function when the empty states uh, are adding? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, not by adding this, the state to the Hilbert space, but once you couple uh, that added state that you have available, keeping the same number of occupied bands, the same filling, adding an, an empty state, coupling it into the system, uh, that, will that, that will allow you to change the one-year uh, one wave function, yeah, of the occupied bands. That's question number one done. Is there a bulk boundary correspondence for this delicate uh, churn number? Um, so in general, for these delicate phases, I think I cannot give you an, a complete answer. Um, in the case of uh, the Hopf insulator, uh, there are definitely boundary states, but it's quite subtle. Um, one has to distinguish cases where the boundary is sharp and non-sharp because generically, you know, the feature that you have uh, something spreading over two unit cells is, is, is lost the moment you have broken translation of symmetry. So um, I would say that by boundary correspondence for delicate systems is, is to some extent still an open problem. Um, yeah. And uh, Mikael, uh, for delicate, uh, types, the one year function lattice has still the same periodicity as the real lattice. Yes, okay, good question. So maybe, you know, from my picture, you would assume um, that you have only twice, uh, twice fewer one year states than you have lattice sites, but um, this thing is now, there are, there are, there are one year states in every unit cell um, as before. So the next one would look like this and so on. They are overlapping, but they are yet, uh, they can be orthogonal in their internal structure, yeah, because every unit cell has already two degrees of freedom and, and so forth. So yeah, good question, but uh, still one, one per unit cell. 
Good. So now um, it's time for me to, to wrap up. And um, I think I promised a little bit too much for these lectures. Maybe I also promised you to give uh, an introduction to non-Hermitian topology, which I entirely didn't uh, uh, get to. Um, I think there are uh, several good reviews on this topic already. If, if you're interested, I can point you to, uh, to one or two and uh, do that in the Slack channel, for instance. Um, let me just say two words uh, that uh, the uh, non-Hermitian uh, topology is basically the idea that you look at uh, systems um, where a Hamiltonian or some sort of a matrix that encodes uh, uh, locality, so where you can build a system with some local couplings or so, um, uh, uh, has a spectrum that, that can be topologically characterized. So it doesn't need to be literally a Hamiltonian of the system because a Hamiltonian should be Hermitian, but it could be a Green's function, it could be some sort of a response function of a classical system or whatever. But something where you have a sense of locally coupling degrees of freedom, and taking a thermodynamic limit and you want to know about the thermodynamically large systems on topological information. So that's something that's been really looked at uh, intensely in the last couple of years. And it's a little bit sad that I didn't get to it, but um, yeah, just know that that there's a lot of uh, development in the topology of these, uh, or in these topological classifications. And it's quite interesting because um, a lot of our intuition breaks down since these non-Hermitian non systems, for instance, they are very sensitive to boundary conditions, but the Bayesian theory doesn't work quite the way it, it does. And um, topology cannot be only encoded in the eigenstates as it's the case here, but it can also be encoded in the, in the eigenvalues. So uh, if you have complex uh, eigenvalues as a non-Hermitian matrix in general does, then you can have a binding uh, of that eigenvalue in the complex plane without anything interesting happening to the eigenstate. And that yeah, could be topological. Is it possible uh, to use a Wilson loop formalism to detect delicate topology? Um, yeah, yes, yeah. For instance, the one that I um, showed with the churn number plus or minus uh, one, um, we can do that. Um, yeah, the Wilson loop would show exactly this uh, this uh, churn flow. So it's actually a good tool. Also in these 3D examples that we study in the, in the paper I gave, it's a good tool to look at the, uh, the Wilson loop spectrum. Yes. Um, okay, good. I should stop here um, and um, ask maybe for more uh, last questions from anyone or comments or anything. Let me check if there are questions in the in the Slack channel. Uh, there is one. I can. I see you say I should uh, just answer. No, that's from yesterday, though. Yeah. Um, Isidora. Is it correct that only after choosing a smooth gauge, the eigenvectors of the Wilson loop correspond to maximally localized Fournier functions along one direction? Um, Yeah, smooth gauge in that one direction, yes. Um, oh, there are five replies to that. Let's see what people, okay, maybe I should do that in peace and quiet later. Yeah, that seems mm -hmm. to be like a, okay. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go into that later. <laughs> ah, here's a question. Delicate topology could be characterized by corner spin hall or anomalous hall effect. Um, no. That, that would be nice. I would love to know what actually is a good way to measure delicate topology or what, what it would be observable. Uh, the quantum spin hall, anomalous hall, conductivity, unfortunately, they vanish for these systems. Yeah. Uh, is the delicate topology one year picture, right? In the delicate topology one year picture, is there any restriction on the spread of the wave function in the sense of do they need to be in? contiguous unit cells or not really? Ah, um, oh, there's no, um, 
I don't think there is a there is a strict uh, sense in which they need to be like in the neighboring unit cells or something. Uh, the statement, um, I, I don't think I can give a complete answer, uh, but the, 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 no, there's no simple statement I can make. It, it, it could depend on the case as well, how many unit cells they go through, but, or whether, but usually I think the cases that we studied are in neighboring unit cells. Um, but I don't, I don't think I can give a very insightful answer to this question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, seems there are no further questions. So, um, yeah, let's just stop here. All right, with, and good. Thank you. thank you, Titus. Thank you for this beautiful talk. Thanks very much. It was a yeah. pleasure. And I hand over um, to Jen. No, is that wait, what's next? Uh, she should be around. Where are She's you? here. Uh, yes. yes. All right. Hi. Hi, I'm everyone. around. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Titus. Yeah, so Hi. You, uh, Jennifer kind of the, doesn't need an introduction now. She's giving the, le the third lecture of this week. So please go ahead. Great. I'll share my screen. Yeah, yeah perfect. OK, great. So again, I can uh, I can't see the Q and A. So just interrupt me when there's questions. So the third lecture that I want to give this week is on topological semi-metals. So I'll start with the canonical example of vial fermions, and then uh, and then move on to Dirac fermions. And there, there's been some interesting uh, work that I've been involved in trying to figure out the analogous, the, um, the analogy of the bulk edge correspondence for Dirac fermions. And then I will talk about generalizations of that, which is the multifold fermions. And there's been some uh, experimental updates on that since, um, since we first predicted those now several years ago. So to start out, let me just, um, let me just make some comment, overarching comment, which is when I first heard of topological semi-metals, the concept was very confusing to me because everything we've talked about in topology so far has been about insulators and it's been very important to keep the band gap open. So I didn't really understand what was protecting these phases. I thought it must be fine tuned in some way or not very robust. But the thing that happens is that if you have a semi-metal and if the Fermi level is not exactly at that uh, band crossing point, then you have a Fermi surface and the Fermi surface is only crossing the gapped areas of the band structure. And so you can define topological invariance on the Fermi surface. And so that's how we can rigorously define topological invariance of semi-metals on their gapped Fermi surface, which is in one lower dimension. So, so that's the overarching picture of how semi-metals can be topological. And now, um, so now I'll start from the beginning. So, Bile fermions, probably most people have seen or heard something or a lot about this. So bile fermions are linear crossings between two bands. So whenever I have a band crossing just between two bands, I could expand the Hamiltonian in the basis just of these two bands. So we can use Pauli matrices to find that basis. So I'll always have a two by two Hamiltonian, which I could expand in uh, increasing orders of K. And if that, um, if that expansion is linear, then I can do always do some basis transformation and rescaling so that the Hamiltonian is just k dot sigma. And this is the canonical Hamiltonian for vial fermion. There's, you know, we could give a whole week's worth of lectures on vial fermions. So this is a very uh, symmetric form. Um, you know, importantly, there's also been type two vial fermions, which have a tilt factor. We could also consider anisotropy. Uh, so there's a lot of different topological uh, deformations that we can make to this. But for now, let's just think of this simple form and any, any smooth deformations of this won't really affect the topology. So, okay, so some important points about vial fermions they don't require any symmetry to protect this crossing. That was another thing that threw me off when I first started uh, learning about this. How can there be a band crossing that doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't have any symmetry protection? How can we not gap it? I think the easiest way to understand this is that suppose you have this K dot sigma Hamiltonian and suppose you were to try to gap it by adding in some other term, any one of the Pauli matrices. You can see that since all the Pauli matrices are present already, any additional term that you add 
will just move the vial fermion around. So it'll open and gap at one place, but it'll be closed somewhere else. And this has been uh, this, this cute phrase, movable but unremovable, has been used to, to describe this situation. We can move these things around, but we can't get rid of them. Um, a different way to understand why vial fermions don't require any symmetry protection is that in a three-dimensional system, we have um, we have a, a, our Hamiltonian in momentum space is a function of three momenta, kx, ky, kz. And since we're expanding in a basis of poly matrices, we have three poly matrices, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. And so in order to get a band crossing, uh, if we expand the Hamiltonian in the basis of poly matrices, we'll get three functions, which are the coefficients of sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. So we have three functions of three variables. And a band crossing occurs when those functions all have simultaneous zeros. And so three functions of three uh, variables can have zeros without any fine tuning. And so that's, that's why uh, this doesn't require any symmetry. And if we were in a different dimension uh, or had different numbers of bands crossing, the situation would be different. Okay, so now moving on to the topology of these things. The point here, as I was saying earlier, is that we can look at the Fermi surface. So a Fermi surface will be a sphere. Um, and that sphere is now a 2D manifold. And as long as the Fermi level is not at zero, uh, it's a 2D manifold where uh, there's a gap everywhere on the Fermi surface. And so we can compute the churn number on the Fermi surface. Um, and it turns out that that churn number is always plus or minus one. And so that's what gives us the topology of these vial fermions. And so I just wrote out this calculation here, not expecting you to do it right now, but just to show that there's nothing tricky about this. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Last time we wrote down this formula for the churn number, but now instead of integrating over the 2D Brion zone, we're gonna integrate over the Fermi surface. Um, and so all you need to do is compute the Berry connection. So if you take the, uh, the block wave function of say the valence band, um, you can compute this Berry connection as easiest to do in spherical coordinates. And then you can see that the churn number will either be plus one or minus one, depending on if you take the conduction or, um, or valence band. And so we say that a vial fermion is a source or a sink of Berry curvature. What this means is that um, the Berry curvature in, in this spherically symmetric case, the, uh, the Berry curvature is always pointing, um, is always pointing outwards uh, all, all over this sphere. And so if you wanted to, there, there's a consequence of this. Um, so that's why it means it's a source because the Berry curvature is always pointing outwards and it's or originating from somewhere in the middle. Um, but now if we try to shrink this sphere, so this is the sphere that I'm thinking of, and if I try to shrink it together, somewhere something pathological has to happen because this Berry curvature is everywhere pointing outwards, um, but which way should it point when we get to the origin? And the only way to resolve this pathology is to have a gapless point in the middle. So, um, so if you have any source or sink of Berry curvature, there has to be a gapless point in the middle, um, and that's exactly what the vial fermion is. And this, uh, the topology of vial fermions is related to these first two points. Um, the reason that we can't remove a vial fermion is exactly because it is topological. So we can understand it in terms of poly matrices, but we can also understand if we have some source of Berry curvature, it can't just disappear. Um, and so. So this is the, uh, I think this is the topology of vial fermions. Consequence of this topology is that there's gonna be edge dates, which in this case, take the form of surface Fermi arcs. So remember uh, last time we talked about if you have an insulator with a churn number, then there's always going to be one gapless edge date, which is connecting the valence band to the conduction band. Now let's move to our vial fermion system. So this is some cube of material, which is meant to be uh, infinite in the X and Y direction. So that's momentum space, but finite in, this, uh, in the Z direction. So it's a slab configuration. And I just said that the Fermi surface surrounding one of these vial points has to have uh, a churn number. And so if you think about taking your Fermi surface and deforming it, you can deform it into two planes and um, since the Fermi surface had a churn number, it must be that the churn number on these two planes uh, differs by one. So one of these planes also has to have a churn number. 
And since we just uh, recalled that planes with a churn number have gapless surface state, then this plane has to have um, has to have a gapless surface state. And so each one of the planes in between these two vial fermions will contribute one gapless surface state. And so there'll be this chain of gapless points which are connecting the two vial fermions. And that's exactly what the Fermi arc is because it gives you a surface Fermi surface, but that surface Fermi surface ends at the two vial points and makes this little arc uh, across the surface. And these, um, so this is just to show some data in, in this previous slide, it seems so clear. It seems like it would be very easy to observe this. Um, actually, the data is a lot more complicated. One of the problems is that a lot of vial materials have many vial points. So one example of this is uh, um, tantalum arsenide. This material has 24 vial points. Some of them are drawn here by these black and white dots. So when you look at the surface, you actually get projections of many vial points. So this is a um, this is a depiction of the surface um, in in momentum space. And so color here is representing a plus or minus vial fermion. And these numbers one or two are telling actually when you look down on the top surface in this material, there's multiple vials that project to the same point. They're related by symmetry. So they literally project to the exact same point. So a charge of two is saying there's two vial fermions here and their combined charges too. So, so we have all of these vial points and this picture is not drawn to scale. Actually, they're a lot closer together. So on this right-hand side, this is a theory calculation of what the surface would look like. These black and white dots are still here. And you can see that these Fermi arcs are actually these little tiny arcs which are connecting, um, which are connecting two vial points. And there's two of them because these two vial points have a charge of two. That's the theory calculation. So still um, the data is even a little bit uh, less clear. And so this is what the data looks like. Uh, you can see it matches pretty well to the theory, but these are actually the Fermi arcs. Um, questions? Yeah, there are two questions. Uh, so the Fermi arc is obtained because for each K point between the Y point in the Vigensen, you can define this construction with planes with a churn number. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that's, yeah, yes is the response, okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> yep, that's, that's exactly right. So just to say, yep, these planes have a churn number, uh, planes that have a churn number have gapless edge state, and every gapless edge state will cross the Fermi level in some place. And so if we fix the Fermi level, there'll be a state there. And then that's the Fermi arc. It's the collection of these states. The second question is, is there a way to predict the trajectory of a Fermi arc? Oh, that's a great question. So first, let me say there could be some confusion, which is you don't know, like in this picture, it has churn number of zero plane, churn number of one plane but maybe you didn't know which was one and which was zero. But that is not ambiguous because we can always compute the churn number of any plane. Um, so we always could know whether the Fermi arc should be going uh, this way or say outside of the Bruin zone. However, the path that the Fermi arc takes is really determined by microscopic details on the surface. So I don't think that there's a way you can constrain these details by computing, um, just by computing topological invariance, and maybe you could compute in different planes and get further constraints. But this line could be curved, could be straight, could be moving all over the place. Um, and you know, as you see here, there's some curvature to these, you know, but it could be a lot bigger of a curvature. Um, so you, those details are determined by the surface details, which might even be different from material to material. Interestingly, it can also be different if you, um, if you truncate on different planes. So say you have some crystal which has different types of planes, maybe because there's different types of atoms. And if you truncate on the A atoms versus the B atoms, that could change the shape of the Fermi arcs. So, um, so you can make some progress with ab initio calculations um, but still there may be surface details like reconstruction that's not accounted for in there. And so I think um, there's, it, it's very hard to precisely predict the trajectory of the Fermi arcs. That's a good question. 
And I'll later show some examples which are even um, even yeah. crazier. So actually, there is another question following up the last one. If you don't know where the surface states appear on a sample, are they useful for any potential application? Ah, you. what I'm saying is that they're difficult to predict their exact shape, but they're highly constrained um, in the fact that they'll always need to say start at a plus and go to a minus. Um, so I think you you still have enough information to um, you still have enough information to maybe use this for for some application, but also the, it may be that every time you cleave a sample the same way, you will more or less get the same Fermi arc. So I I'd expect that there's some um, I'd expect that there's some consistency, but I'm I don't think you can from theory, 100% predict the trajectory of Fermi arcs. And at this point, you know, applications is a great question. And I'm not sure that if there was any uh, application for vial fermions, I'm not sure that it would rely on the Fermi arcs or maybe something, some other properties um, of, of vials, like their transport properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. These are great questions. <clears throat> so the other thing that I want to say about vial fermions is this chiral anomaly. So this is actually, I'm going to show some data on sodium bismuth. <clears throat> sodium bismuth is actually a Dirac material, but in a magnetic field uh, with a Zeeman term, the Dirac point, which I'll talk about in a bit, splits into two vials. So for now, let's just treat this as a vial material. The important thing here is that I want to talk about Landau levels for vial fermions. So last time we talked about Lando levels in 2D, um, the difference for Lando levels in 3D is that they can have a dispersion uh, parallel to the magnetic field because there's one extra dimension in there. And so um, as in graphene, for any Dirac cone, when you compute the Lando levels, you'll get a zero Lando level. So that's what we're seeing here. Just look at one K point, you get all these Lando levels, you get a zero Lando level, and then you get some others. And the spacing is different than for the free electron gas, um, It's but it's the same thing as for graphene. And I'll refer, refer you to this review article um, for more details on this. But now this, this zero Lando level has to disperse. And so it has to choose to either be you know, left moving or right moving. And the way that it chooses that is based on the chirality of your vial fermion. Um, vial fermions always have to come in pairs. I didn't say that before, but it, maybe it was obvious. Um, maybe it wasn't. If you have a source of Fairy curvature, you also need to have a sink somewhere else. And so by the periodicity of the Bruin zone, the vial fermions always come in pairs. And so you'll end up with a set of Lando levels for one vial fermion, which has a chiral mode in one direction. And then for the other vial fermion, it'll have this chiral Lando level in the other, uh, in the other direction. And okay, so that's the Lando level structure. Now, if we apply an electric field, what happens is that an electric field will change the occupation of these chiral Lando levels um, because they cross zero energy. And so these levels must connect somewhere deep down below the Fermi level. And if we apply an electric field parallel to the magnetic field, electric electrons will be pumped from the left moving type to the right moving type. And so there's a charge pumping um, between the left and right vial fermions and you can compute the rate of this and it goes like E dot B. And so one way to test this uh, in an experiment is to compute magnetotransport in a magnetic field and change the, uh, change the angle between the electric field and the magnetic field. So that's what this little schematic is showing us. They're measuring current in one direction. That's the direction of the applied field. And then the, applying a magnetic field, which is, um, which is separated by some angle. And they're varying the angle between these. And all these different lines are showing all these different angles. And so when E is parallel to B, that's, um, that's like these zero degree plots, then what happens to the magneto resistance is that as you increase the magnetic field, the resistance decreases, which means conductance is increasing. And so that is that conduction is exactly the conduction that's resulting from this E dot B term. And this is called the chiral anomaly because uh, what it means is that left and right fermions are not conserved. 
Uh, that's the that's that's basically the definition of chiral anomaly. It's anomalous in high energy physics. In condensed matter physics, it's not really anomalous because we know that these bands must connect somewhere. Band structures are always continuous, and so it makes sense that you can pump from one to the other. But if you just look at the low energy theory, the left and right fermions are disconnected from each other, um, and so it's a little bit strange that you get this pumping. So that pumping results in a current. The current goes like E dot B. And so if we increase the magnetic field, we get an increased current and decreased resistivity. And that's the negative magneto resistance that we see in these zero degree plots. If we go to 90 degrees, you can see that the shape of these curves completely changes. Uh, e dot B is zero at exactly 90 degrees. And there we get more normal magneto resistance, which is as you turn up the B field, the resistance increases, electrons become more localized. So this is, so, the, the point of me showing you this is um, it's just to show that when people talk about negative magneto resistance, that's a defining feature of vial fermions, and these are the types of plots that it's referring to. So just to uh, summarize, why would we care about vial fermions? I've shown you some interesting experimental observations, um, and one that I didn't talk about, which is quantum oscillations between the the Fermi surface is not just in the bulk, but also connects to these surface Fermi arcs. And so you can get surprising types of quantum oscillations. So on the experimental side, there's some interesting phenomena that you don't see in other systems. On the theory side, I think it's really interesting because we have a lot of concepts that are coming together. Uh, so in particular, the roles of symmetry and topology are all, um, are all interplaying in these vial systems. Obviously, the topology is quite ev evident through the churn number. And then there's also this interplay between uh, with high energy physics, which has actually gotten some people who worked on the chiral anomaly in different contexts and high energy physics interested in condensed matter physics. So from the theoretical side, it's also a pretty fascinating topic. But I think that the real reason why this field of vial fermions took off um, about six years ago is really because of this interplay between the two. So the ability to do ab initio calculations, which are very accurate, um, predict materials, you can directly compare the data, you know, ARPA's data is something that you can directly compare to ab initio calculations quite easily. Um, I think this interplay between theory and experiment is what is really interesting about this field and what was driving it forwards. Um, and so I think that's why this became so popular. So now I want to move on to Dirac fermions. Um, so Dirac fermions are in some sense two copies of vial fermions. They occur when, uh, when two bands, so doubly degenerate bands, cross another group of doubly degenerate bands. And so I want to say a little bit first about the role of symmetry. So inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry are the most crucial thing here. They both map K to minus K. So inversion symmetry flips the chirality of a vial fermion. Um, this is because if we think back to that K dot sigma Hamiltonian, inversion symmetry takes K to minus K. And so vial fermions of K dot sigma and minus K dot sigma uh, have opposite chirality. Time reversal symmetry also takes K to minus K, but because it's anti-unitary, it also flips the sigma Y matrix. And so um, if you think every time you flip one of the K directions to minus itself, you flip chirality, time reversal effectively only has two flips. And so it leaves chirality invariant. Therefore, the product of inversion and time reversal leaves every K point invariant, but flips chirality. And so this would forbid the existence of a vial fermion because it says that every time you had a vial fermion, the combination of P and T would give you back another vial fermion at the same point with opposite chirality. So vial fermions are not allowed if you have both inversion and time reversal. But if you, um, if you do have both of those things that can protect a Dirac fermion. And so one way to think of a Dirac fermion is as a combination of a plus and minus vial with opposite chirality on top of each other in momentum space. Now it requires not just this PT combination, but also rotation symmetry to protect this. And so I think it's actually, to me, the easiest way to think of this is, let's do an example, which is suppose that we have fourfold rotation symmetry along some, say along the Z axis, then along that axis, bands have fourfold rotation eigenvalues. There's four possible eigenvalues, which are the fourth roots of, uh, of minus one. And so 
two bands, the PT inversion times time reversal symmetry will cause bands to be doubly degenerate. Um, and it will, because of the anti-unitarity of time reversal, these doubly degenerate pairs will have opposite fourfold rotation eigenvalues. So, but since there's four possible eigenvalues, if you have one pair with say eigenvalues e to the plus or minus i pi over four, they can cross another pair with the op other two eigenvalues, e to the plus or minus three pi i over four. And this crossing will be protected by rotation symmetry, but also this combination of inversion and time reversal symmetry. And so inversion, time reversal, and rotation can protect Dirac fermions. And what the other thing to say here is that the rotation has to be either three, four, or six fold. If you only have a two fold rotation, then you only have two eigenvalues. And so there's not pairs of eigenvalues that can cross in this way. So the next question um, is, are Dirac fermions topological? So originally, at least, when I started working in this field, I heard from conversations that Dirac fermions would have Fermi arcs. And so I think this idea was floating in the literature. And the thought was, if we can think of a Dirac fermion as two vials on top of each other with opposite charge, and there's some other Dirac fermion somewhere else, also two vials on top of each other, each of those vials should contribute Fermi arcs. And so you should have double Fermi arcs like this. Um, this really neat paper, uh, there's actually two papers by this group, showed that this was not true. Um, in fact, if you write down the simplest model of a Dirac fermion, some four band model, then yes, you will get these double Fermi arcs, but they're not symmetry required. And as you add more terms, generic terms to your model, these things can detach. They can form some detached Fermi surface and then they can go through other types of topological transitions. And then and there are some instances where they can be completely removed. So, um, Dirac fermions are not required to have gapless surface states. Uh, question? Yeah, uh, there is a question by Maxine Gorlach. I wonder if Dirac point can arise in the gamma point in the system with C4 symmetry. Is it a quadratic band crossing instead? Yeah, so this is somewhat of a, um, somewhat of a question of semantics. Um, so I'm talking about this type of Dirac point on a high symmetry line. Yes, you can also have fourfold band crossings protected at the gamma point. Um, those are a little bit different. You know, they don't occur from this mechanism. So when I'm saying Dirac fermion, I'm actually only going to be talking about these for today. But yes, you can have symmetries in the cubic space groups. You end up with quadratically dispersing bands from gamma, and that's also a four band crossing. But that has, um, you know, it's a little bit different it's a little bit different than this and I would expect it to have different properties. So I'm gonna kind of keep that separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, good question. Okay, so, so Dirac fermions don't have a bulk edge correspondence. And so you might um, deduce from that that Dirac fermions don't have any topological properties. So now I'll try to um, convince you otherwise. So, the first argument that Dirac fermions could be topological is what I said before. Dirac fermions secretly have two vial fermions inside of them. And so if you apply a field, you will split your Dirac point into two vial points. Um, and so this is the example of sodium bismuth that I showed before. Um, and, and in addition, actually, this is directly related to the previous question. One thing that we studied several years ago was suppose you have one of these quadratic band touchings at gamma and you apply a magnetic field, then this also will give you vial points. So somehow Dirac fermions are some kind of parent phase for vial fermions. So it seems like they have some hidden topological nature inside of them. But even more compelling than that is this idea of a higher order Fermi arc. Um, and so this will give us some kind of bulk edge correspondence. It will actually be a, a bulk hinge correspondence. So to understand these higher order Fermi arcs, uh, we need to return to the idea of the quantized quadrupole insulator or higher order TI in 2D. So, uh, so I'll first talk a little bit about this model and then on the next slide show how this gives us these higher order Fermi arcs. So what is this model? It's saying that in 2D, if we have the appropriate set of symmetries, including this fourfold rotation, then you can get a quantized dipole moment, which is vanishing, 
um, and a quantized quadrupole moment. And so this quadrupole moment, which is quantized, will tell us that we need to have corner states in our system. So vanishing dipole means that we have gapped surfaces, but there'll be charges on the corners where two surfaces meet. Uh, and so in this paper, they provide some explicit model of this. There's four sites in the unit cell and there's two different types of hopping terms. And so, uh, so this gives us a one parameter Hamiltonian. So we can plot the energy spectrum of our 2D system as a function of the ratio of these parameters. And we see that there's two types of insulating phases. Here, we'll just get some kind of band gap. Uh, this will be a normal insulator. But once we cross some critical point, then we start seeing these mid gap states. And if you look at the spatial localization of these states, you see that they're uh, localized at the corners. And so this, uh, and so that's what the higher order um, TI or quantized quadrupole insulator phase is. It has, it's an insulator and it has mid gap states, which are localized at the corners of the system where two surfaces meet. And this invariant is protected by these symmetries that I listed here. Um, there's different combinations of symmetries that, that you can consider. But in this case, they're considering mirror symmetries, inversion symmetry, and a fourfold rotation symmetry. OK, so now coming back to our Dirac material. So this is some schematic. These are my two Dirac points. I actually have all those symmetries that I showed on the previous slide. In particular, I already said we need inversion symmetry and fourfold rotation symmetry in order to protect the Dirac points. And so for any 2D slice of this material, which is perpendicular to the z-axis, I can ask what is the quadrupole invariant of that slice? And that answers the question, does it have corner states or does it not have corner states? And what we found in this paper uh, led by Ben Weider, is that the planes in between the Dirac points will have a high order TI quadrupole index. And then when you go, when you jump, so there's a bunch of planes, and then eventually you'll have a plane with the Dirac point. And then when you look at the plane above the Dirac point, that quadrupole index is now zero. And so for this intermediate set of planes, they will all have corner states. That's what these charges are meant to show, uh, or circles are meant to show. Um, and then therefore there's, we're on this 3D material where two surfaces meet, there'll be a series of mid gap mo modes. And so that's what we're calling higher order Fermi arcs. These modes are localized on a hinge where two surfaces meet and they end at the projections of the Dirac points on this hinge. And so I should say that what we're thinking here, it's again, it's this hybrid real space momentum space picture that I talked about for vial fermions. Here, the z direction is infinite. So we have a kz, a good quantum number um, in momentum space in z direction, but the x and y directions are finite. And so we're talking about surfaces which are normal to x and y. And then the hinge is the place where those two surfaces meet. And so this is some example um, of this hinge band structure. So again, it has one good momentum, which is the infinite direction. Um, so that's what we're plotting. The spectrum is a function of that. And we can see that uh, in the middle, we get some kind of insulating phase. But here, uh, where we have these planes that have the um, non-trivial quadrupole index, we get these corner states. Um, you can't see from the plot that they're corner states. All we see is that they're mid-gap states, which are between um, localized in the, in the gap away from the Dirac points. Now, in this particular plot, um, it, actually, we don't have time reversal symmetry. We just have the product of inversion and time reversal together. Um, but we can actually get more material candidates if we consider time reversal invariant systems. The only obstruction is that a lot of these time reversal invariant systems also have surface states because they have 2D planes, which are 2D TIs. And so some examples that we considered were cadmium arsenide, and uh, potassium, um, I'm sorry, um, potassium manganese bismuth. Uh, and so what we see here, so it's a little bit tricky to interpret. This flat band is this flatness here. And um, the Dirac point, which is this little point, is zoomed in here. And so this is the higher order Fermi arc, this mode which is occurring inside of this very uh, small gap on either side of the Dirac point. But you also have surface states at the projection of gamma because in this material, as well as cadmium arsenide, that 2D plane is a 2D TI, which contributes 
surface states. Are you doing for the direct questions already? Is there a similar to bile semi-metals? There, um, there are that states that Dirac points must appear must appear in pairs. Is there a similar? Ah, uh, yes. So okay. um yeah. right. The Dirac points, yes. The Dirac points also actually I think it's a little bit simpler than that, which is that um since we have time reversal and inversion, we always have, if there's a Dirac point at K, there's always gonna be a Dirac point at minus K. So that's one way to think of it. Um, but yes, there's also some modification. Yeah, you can also think of some modification of the um, Nielsen-Ninomia theorem or whatever theorem you wanna to use to say that there's two vial points. This also has to occur for Dirac points by continuity of um, basically by continuity of the band structure. So you have two bands crossing at one place, but they have opposite eigenvalues. And since the Bruin zone is periodic, they have to cross back again to satisfy that. So these types of Dirac points always occur in pairs. Now the quadratic Dirac cones points that were asked about earlier, um, those don't have to occur in pairs. So again, those are a little bit different. The next one is, are the Fermi arcs degenerate? or why are they called higher order? Ah, uh, right, right. So um, higher order is referring to, this is meant to be an analogy to higher order TIs. Higher order TIs have um, gapped bulk, gap surfaces and gapless where two surfaces meet. And that's how these Fermi arcs are. There's a gapped surface, but these Fermi arcs are where two surfaces meet. So that's what the higher order is referring to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the materials you just showed, is this without the standard magnetic field? Yes, right there. I don't, did you say standard magnetic field? But these materials external. have no magnetic field. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, good. And so now, um, so I guess the, the other thing I don't think I said explicitly, so just to say this invariant now is directly analogous to vial fermions. In vial fermions, we talked about how you can take a churn number of 2D planes and the churn number is gonna jump as you cross the vial point. Here we're saying you can take the higher order TI or quadruple index of a 2D plane and that index is gonna jump as you cross the Dirac point. So I think this is a very satisfying analogy um, and in, in addition to that connection, it's also satisfying because it gives us this bulk hinge correspondence, which I would say firmly, um, firmly means that Dirac fermions do have a topological attribute to them. So I wanna make a few more comments on the topological classification of Dirac points. So first, um, just to advertise uh, my own work, although it's unpublished at the moment, um, working with my student Yuan Fong, uh, what we showed is that the argument I just gave for the higher order Fermi arcs was only discussed in the context of fourfold rotation symmetry. And so we can make this better. Uh, we've extended this classification to other rotations, and we see that there can actually be multiple types of Fermi arcs that have a more complicated algebra associated with them. And so we think that this firmly answers the question of what kinds of Dirac points um, can have higher order Fermi arcs. But we are by no means the first people to try to classify the topology of Dirac points. So I'll just show some of these earlier references. Uh, first by Yang and Nagayosa, um, what they did to classify Dirac points was look at the topological invariance of 2D planes. So you have some Dirac point along a high symmetry line, and you can ask what's the 2D TI index of the gamma plane versus the KZ equals pi plane and compare those. And that serves as some other kind of classification. Um, you can also look at mirror churn number. Then there is, I guess, I guess one year later, some other really nice paper by um, some overlap of authors where they do something similar to, to what I just discussed. They consider a Dirac point as a crossing of different types of eigenvalues, and they can assign a topological charge um, based on the difference in the eigenvalues that cross. And so they also give some kind of classification, which will say every time two bands with different eigenvalues cross, that contributes one. And if you have multiple of these, therefore we have some kind of Z index. 
Uh, and in the C6 case, they find that there's two different types of crossings. That's because there's um, three different flavors of eigenvalues corresponding to this, the six roots of minus one. And so there you can say, um, if type A and type B cross, that gives me one Z index. If B and C cross, that's another Z index. So they get Z cross Z. So this is another classification, topological classification of Dirac points, similar and different to, what, to our work. And then extremely recently, uh, less than one year ago, there was a, another, um, another paper classifying the topology of Dirac points. And here, what they're really doing is establishing that Dirac points are a source of um, Berry curvature. It's just not the same Berry curvature we were talking about before. It's a non-abelian Berry curvature, um, which is over, uh, basically you need to symmetry resolve your Fermi surface because you have degenerate bands. And once you symmetry resolve that, you get some type of Berry curvature and the Dirac points are a source of, um, a source of that. So these are all different classifications um, of Dirac points. And we compared our work at least to these two older papers. And these three classifications uh, do not, they're not in one-to-one -one correspondence. Something which is topological here might not be here or vice versa and same with here. Um, and so when you talk about the topology of Dirac points, you need to be specific as to what you're looking for. What we're looking for is higher order Fermi arcs. Um, and for these other classifications, for some of them, um, not this one, because they're talking about 2D invariance of trim planes, but for the others, it's not clear what the physical observable will be, although it's they're definitely um, you know, interesting and important mathematical classifications. So I think this theory of topology of Dirac points is coming together, but there's still some questions which are, what are the physical signatures of, um, of these other topological classifications? So, okay, so I've talked about vial and Dirac points. I want to make this distinction, which I said in answer to a question earlier, Dirac points are crossings along some high symmetry line. So it's when irreps, different irreps cross each other. That's what this red is one ear up, green is another. When they cross, it's protected by symmetry. There's other types of symmetry protected band crossings, which is if you look at some high symmetry point, you can just classify the ear ups of that point. And for certain groups, you can get higher dimensional crossings there. So Dirac points fall into this category. I mean, vial points are separate because they don't require symmetry. And I now want to switch gears and talk for the last little bit about um, about these types of crossings. So, um, so this actually, this ties into to the earlier lectures, um, the lectures I gave. So there's symmetry protected topological fermions beyond Dirac and bile fermions. That's what I'm gonna talk about for the remainder um, of this time. How do we classify them? Uh, well, first off, we need to recall our discussion on space groups earlier in the week. So symmetry of crystals is classified by space groups. There's 230 space groups. Um, if you don't include time reversal symmetry, you get magnetic space groups, and there's a lot more of these. So what's the method for classifying these types of degeneracies? Um, in each space, space group at each K, you have this little group of K, which I, um, which I defined on, on Monday or Tuesday, the set of symmetries that leave that K point invariant. This, this is just saying it can be invariant up to a reciprocal lattice vector. So then if you look at some particular K point, the bands at that K point are transforming as irreps of that little group. So some classification then of symmetry protected degeneracies at high symmetry points is look at the dimension of the little group. Um, what are the dimensions, not, not the dimension of the group, but the dimensions of the irreps of that group. Those dimensions of irreps will tell us about the number of bands that can be symmetry protected and cross at that, at that high symmetry point. So oftentimes, if we're talking about a trim point, well, time reversal will just force you to have 2D irreps, but there's not any higher constraint. But in the cubic groups, then you can get um, 4D irreps. Uh, and th those will be the quadratic touchings. Actually, that, that's one of the things which is pictured here. Um, and what we find found is that at other high symmetry points at the corners of the Brian zone, then you can get even higher crossings. And so just for a little bit of history, um, so we carried out this procedure, which was let's look at all the space groups, 
all their high symmetry points and look at the dimensions of EREPs of those little groups and see what types of crossings we can get. And we carried this out by looking through an old textbook. Um, if you're interested, very interested in learning about space groups, then I would recommend this textbook. Um, it has a lot of detail on EREPs and how to construct them. So we carried it out in a very brute force way. In 2017, um, in, with this topological quantum chemistry theory that I talked about on Tuesday, all that information is now uploaded on the Bilbao crystallographic server. So if you want to know about EREPs of high symmetry points, I would recommend that you look at the BCS instead of looking in this book. But if you want to know about how the classification of band structures um, and space groups uh, is done, then, then this book is a, is a difficult but great reference. So this is the results of our search. We found that besides two and fourfold degeneracies, which we already knew about from bile and Dirac fermions, that we could get three, six, and eightfold degeneracies. And in all of these examples, this is a, considering there's 230 space groups, this is a pretty small list. Um, these all have a very specific property, which is that these are all non-somorphic space groups. So I'll explain a little bit why um, in a moment, but these combinations of screw and glide symmetries can, can enforce higher degeneracies. And so, right, so these are some of the main messages. Two, four, three, six, eight. Those are the only degeneracies that are possible in crystals if you, for generic band structures, so i.e. not fine-tuned. And this is including time reversal and, um, and spin-orbit coupling. If you, if you don't have spin-orbit coupling, you can actually get a couple of higher degeneracies. And these things are now called multifold fermions, and they're only available in these certain space groups, which I've enumerated here. So now I want to give a couple examples of these multifold fermions. Um, the first example, which I think is the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting, is what we call the spin one vial fermion. The Hamiltonian looks like this. So you can see the similarity to the vial Hamiltonian. But instead of being poly matrices, these S's are spin one matrices. So that's why we called it a spin one vial. And so again, like I said, for vial fermions, the Hamiltonian doesn't have to look like this. It can be uh, tilted and deformed, um, but, but this is kind of the, uh, the canonical form. And in this form, we can exactly diagonalize and see that we get one flat band. This will just be flat to leading order, not completely flat. And then two other linear bands. And again, we can compute the churn number of each band. What that means is the same thing it meant for vial fermions. We take a Fermi surface at an energy in this band and compute the churn number of the Fermi surface. And this top band will be plus two and the bottom band will be minus two or vice versa. So this thing is a charge two source of very curvature. It only occurs in two types of space groups. And since it's a three band crossing, it does not occur at trim points. It occurs at this P point, which is, um, which is not a trim point. And so to give some, a little bit of intuition as to how you can get a threefold degeneracy, um, what happens is that normally with spin orbit coupling, a twofold rotation, if I square it, will square to minus one, because basically that's a total of a two pi rotation and fermions get a minus one under two pi rotation. Similarly, a threefold, if I cube it, will give me minus one. But in these non-somorphic space groups, um, something different can happen because you're not just doing a rotation, you're also translating. Um, and so those translations give you a phase e to the i k t. So at some trim points, that phase will cancel your minus one and give you a plus one. And so, so in that sense, these crossings are an, we can get an integer spin here because these things are behaving locally like bosons instead of fermions, just in the sense that a two pi rotation is giving you a plus instead of a minus. And so that changes the degeneracies that you would normal get, normally get. I wouldn't, these are still fermionic excitations, so I wouldn't read too much into that. But locally, if you look at those degrees of freedom, it's transforming like a spin one object. So at these particular, at this particular P point, um, because of this property, we can only get either 1D or these special 3D EREPs. And this is due to the non-smorphic symmetry, which is changing these phase relations. So that's why the non-smorphic symmetries are playing an important role. 
So we built some tight binding model, which is meant to realize this. It's just some fictitious thing, not based on any real material. And we see that if we look at the P point, we just get one or three fold crossing. So these are the things that we're interested in. And so then we can look at the um, look at the surface spectrum. And so we get some, you know, if we were moving kind of from these P points inwards to gamma, uh, there's a lot of states in here. And so that's what this kind of tornado of states is. This point is the projection of the P point. And so we can very, very clearly see that we get two Fermi arcs coming out of this point. And that's because these um, spin one vials are, a, like I said, a charge two source of very curvature. So they'll always give us two Fermi arcs. It means that nearby planes have a churn number of two. And actually, if we take a loop in this direction and plot energy as a function of momentum around this loop, then we can clearly see that these two states have a chirality. They're connecting the valence and conduction bands, and there's two chiral states, which is necessary and sufficient to say that the, the 2D plane that this is outlining um, has a churn number of two. We can also look at Lando levels for this. Um, and what we see is that because of this churn number of two, there's two chiral Landau levels. So if I take some constant slice, I'll always, you know, up here, we have some bands which contribute uh, negative slope and positive slope. They don't contribute to the chirality, but then we have these two extras and these are the two chiral Landau levels. And you see that they only move in one direction. So this is similar to the vial points, um, which have one chiral Landau level, which only moves in one direction. But the level spacing here is similar to the level spacing of a Dirac cone or a single vial point. It goes like root n. That's coming from the linear bands. And in addition, because of those flat bands, um, that, that flat band at zero energy, then we also get a, many, a series of Lando levels that are kind of localized in a small window around zero energy. So this is a pretty distinct uh, structure of Lando levels, similarities and differences from normal vial fermions. And there's some materials, um, some candidate materials that we propose. And I guess the thing to highlight here is that this idealized version of a linear band crossing and a flat band is not so ideal in real materials, um, at least the ones that we originally found, because these bands, it's, it's flat over only basically a zero window of, um, of, of the Bruin zone. These things are immediately curving downwards. And so these materials, it's gonna be possibly difficult to observe, um, even observe things like Fermi arcs because there's a lot of other bands nearby. And here's some other material candidates. Um, so since I'm running, running out of time, I'll just try to wrap up uh, in the next few minutes. Um, so the interesting thing is that these things actually have been observed in the past couple of years since we predicted them, but they're observed in a different way than we predicted. So we were looking at materials with spin orbit coupling, but actually in this cobalt psilocyte, which has smaller negligible spin orbit coupling, um, you get different degeneracies with or without spin orbit coupling. It makes sense because spin orbit coupling will, um, you know, can give you a spin degeneracy or, or it can split spin degeneracies. And so, uh, in this material, you get these spin one vial points at gamma point at the gamma point. Um, and so they see these in the bulk band structure so that that's what the that's what this paper is. Um, but theoretically, you can also look at the surface states and then you can see this thing is a spin one at gamma and it has these two Fermi arcs that are coming out of there consistent with the um, turn number of two. And this comes back to the earlier question. Can you predict the shape of Fermi arcs? Um, this would have been a very hard one to predict. They have this kind of weird serpentine structure winding around. And so the Fermi arcs in real materials can take pretty exotic shapes. You can also have a spin three halves vial. These have also been predicted and, um, and observed in some materials. And again, these things will have actually even higher churn bands. And so you get even more Fermi arcs, which are winding around uh, the surface Bruin zone. Um, and there's been some really interesting work uh, of these spin three half fermions in different materials of this structure type. So this is just one example um, where you can see these things and you can see these firm, these are the Fermi arcs which are winding around kind of similar to the theoretical prediction on the previous slide. So you might start to wonder how long can we go on with this? Uh, we have spin half, spin one, spin three halves. And the answer is this is, the end of the story. As long as we are talking about symmetry protected degeneracies, actually three halves is the highest is the highest one that can exist in crystals. And so these are 
this is a picture of a vial fermion. This is the spin one vial I was talking about. And then these are the spin three halves that I was just mentioning. The last, um, the last thing that I want to mention is a different type of multifold fermion, which is like a spin one Dirac. So maybe I'll just take the questions at the end. Um, earlier, we were talking about how we can think of a Dirac fermion as two copies of vial fermions with opposite charge. This spin one Dirac, we can think of as two copies of a spin one vial with opposite charge. And they're protected in the same way by inversion symmetry. So again, the combination of time reversal and inversion can kind of give you these degeneracies, which have no net chirality. But with a field, you could split them and see that they actually consist of two, um, two chiral features. And so again, this can only occur in a, a couple of space groups. It looks exactly like the spin one, but each of these bands is doubly degenerate. So it's actually a six-fold crossing. And again, we have some um, materials where we can expect to see these, although it's gonna be hard to probe them um, since there's other bands which are nearby in energy. Um, and so I think, so these, so these ones, I don't think that there's been any observation of yet. And then the last one that I wanna mention, I talked about three, six, so how about I mention something about the eight folds. Um, you can also have eight fold band crossings. Here in this example, all the bands are doubly degenerate. In lines, they emanate away and have fourfold degeneracies. Um, these so-called double Dirac fermions were also predicted um, at, at the same time and uh, at the same time out of Charlie Kane's group with Ben Weeder. And so there, the interesting thing that they pointed out, which which we also elaborated on, is that you can think of this eightfold degeneracy as some kind of parent state, which has a lot of different topological states embedded in it. And you can realize those by applying different types of perturbations. So if you apply, um, if you apply strain in different directions, you can open a gap and you can get either a strong TI or a weak TI. If you apply a magnetic field, you can split up these degenerate line nodes and you can split them up and get either a Dirac type crossing or two vial type crossings. Uh, I, actually, I think these, these are also Dirac's, they're just in different directions, um, gapless and gapped. So this thing, depending on how you, how you strain it or uh, what perturbations you apply, can realize all different types of other topological phases. In magnetic semi-metals, you more or less get the same types of physics, uh, or at least from a theoretical perspective, the same degeneracies, but it's a lot more complicated. And especially what's more complicated is that in any magnetic material, there could be many possible spin configurations. And from the ab initio perspective, you need to compare the energies of all of these. So it's harder, um, but the end result is that you can also get these same types of degeneracies. And then there's some, some, interesting, um, some interesting thing that happens, which is that sometimes the magnetic space groups actually reduces the number of free parameters, just depending on how the magnetic symmetries commute or anti-commute with each other. And so you can get some more highly uh, idealized cases. This is one of the best examples that we found, which is showing these threefold crossings um, at high symmetry points. And you can see the unit cell and the magnetic order is extremely complicated. So finally, um, since I talked a lot about current, um, really about current research over the past several years, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, which are theory, experiment, uh, ab initio and group theory. So there's been a lot of people contributing in this area from many different perspectives. And I think that's also which made, which has made this field develop so quickly and in such interesting directions. And these are the main, uh, the main conclusions that I want to leave you with. So maybe just to summarize one sentence, vial fermions are sources of Berry curvature um, therefore, they have this interesting bulk edge correspondence and we consider them chiral. But some of the other types of multifold fermions and also Dirac fermions are not chiral. And so it remains in these cases to figure out what's the topological signatures of these symmetry protected fermions. Okay, I will stop here um, and take a couple of minutes for any remaining questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. There is actually one Question, I think it's more than a comment, right? So I think you can simulate this spin wild vial in superconducting junctions with three couple Majoranas at two independent phases. I don't know if that's a more a comment than a question. Yeah, so yeah, so I don't know about that. Our classification was based on time reversal 
and spin orbit coupling, and we did not include any superconductivity. So that would be a completely different type of classification since it has different types of uh, requirements like particle hole symmetry. So that sounds that sounds really interesting. And right, I didn't mention anything about degeneracies of in, in superconductors. So yeah, I appreciate that comment. Okay. I think I can mm -hmm. make a, a comment on that. Um... If I may, uh, yeah, sorry. please. Uh, yeah, so there's this. Uh, I think they fall in the in the synthetic systems type of uh, ideas, where you want to realize a band structure that resembles some some solid state, uh, interesting band structure, and and you can take this multi-terminal just of some junctions and control the phases independently, and then kind of get some some dispersion relation. And uh, there's definitely a way of doing vials. I mean, there's a there's a way of people uh, to make uh, uh, a way for people to make uh, things that might not exist, like higher higher dimensions, for example, uh, which is right. interesting. And if I may, I, I actually wanted to ask you a question <laughs> uh, now that I mentioned this uh, because this question was perfect. So there's this synthetic platforms that it can do uh, higher dimensions, um, and you said that uh, you can do up to eightfold, I guess, in three D. So mm -hmm. is, there, is it known, like the sequence, uh, you know, how, what are the fermions that can be made in, in different dimensions or is this too complicated? Or? Yeah, so from my perspective, there's not like some pattern, uh, you know, may, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think that the three, six, eight here is, um, I wouldn't expect that from that information that you could deduce anything about the higher dimensions. So the same lot, you know, as you know, the same logic would apply. We need to consider say four dimensional space groups, look at the little groups, classify the EREPs. And my understanding is that once you look at space groups higher than three dimensions, the uh, there's just a lot of them. I, I don't know the number actually. Um, I think it gets a lot more complicated, but the logic would still hold. Um, but I don't know if they're, I don't even know if they're all enumerated or not. So yeah, I definitely don't know the answer to that. And if people can make systems that simulate higher dimensions, then it's worth looking into. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Irian Sanchez asks, well, uh, since vile fermions can be considered as monopoles of very curvature, if any, what would be the geometrical interpretation of Fermi arcs and their chiral characterization? So I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Um, the only thing that I can say is what I said before, like if, Fermi arcs are occurring at a fixed energy because they're part of the Fermi surface. But from my perspective, I, I also kind of like to think of plotting energy versus dispersion. Um, and so then the Fermi arcs, if you if instead of plotting fixed energy, if you take a slice and plot E versus K, they'll have a chirality. So um, so, so that, that, that's how they know about chirality. But I don't know if there's, I don't know if we can consider them to be themselves like a, a, a source of, a source or sink of anything. I guess the other interesting thing to say that I didn't mention is that you can also have like spin winding on these Fermi arcs. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's some nice, uh, some nice analogy in the same way that vile fermions are a source of very curvature. Mm -hmm. And anonymous attendee is asking, in multifold fermions, we have different band crossings. How could we calculate the charm number by hand or by pair of bands? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, but this is actually good. So, right. What you should do is uh, look at a Fermi surface. So these are 3D systems. So the Fermi surfaces will be 2D or I should say a fixed energy contour. Um, and so for example, if we look at this case, fixed energy, then I'll just be sitting in one band. And so then my fixed energy contour will be 2D and I can compute the churn number of that, no problem. Um, in, in these other cases, which have multiple dispersing bands, then you'll have multiple fixed energy contours. So if I fix the energy, I'll have a contour in this band and a contour in this band. 
but those things won't cross each other. So again, I don't have any fundamental difficulty. I just have, um, I just have multiple Fermi surfaces that I need to consider, but each one is only for one band. And so I can firmly compute the churn number of that band without any ambiguity. Okay. Thank you again. And actually, there are no more questions. Let me check the, the Slack channel. There is nothing there. I actually have a, a brief and very small question. You, you mentioned about uh, using a strain, right, to control yes. or to tune uh, topological phases. Uh, you mean uniaxial strain or biaxial compression and stretching at the same time? Right. Or just uh, stretching compression? Yeah, so um, it kind of depends on what you want to do. So, right, if you use, um, if you have a uniform strain, which is isotropic, then you will preserve all the crystal symmetry. And so then you won't break the degeneracy. So mm -hmm. if you want to, you, you could change the dispersion perhaps. If you want to break the degeneracy, then you'll need to use strain, which is not isotropic. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, thank you. So no further questions. Uh, so let's thank you, Jennifer, kind of for these beautiful three talks of this week. And uh, we will go for a break now, 20 minutes. So we will reconvene at five uh, European time. So thank you, Jennifer, again. I hope to see you next year here personally in San Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Listo. Gracias. Sí, listo. Gracias. Bueno, nos vemos en... ¿Cuánto es? ¿Cuánto tiempo ah, es? 20 minutos. Es que, ¿Sabes minutos? lo que pasa? Que hay un link, eh, es un poco confuso porque lo, la gente que atiende solo tiene un link, pero los, los speakers tienen un link para cada día. Vale. Entonces, eh, pero no te están llegando esos links, parece. Pero, bueno, no, no creo. Pero es igual, eh, tampoco cuesta nada. Si nos lo recuerdas, nos mandas un mensaje. Sí. Sí, no sí. recuerdas que te tenemos que poder dejar presentar y ya está. Sí. sí. Además, este, yo solo tengo dos charlas, así que esta es la última. Listo. Ah, vale. Sí, sí, o sea que ya no tengo que estar como panelista, no me necesitas bueno, como si panelista. Quieres, no. Si quieres estar como panelista, te, te, te dejamos. No es lo que... <risa> Pero la única ventaja que tiene eso es que puedes escuchar a la gente que pasa en el pasillo. <risa> Sí. Porque yo no soy muy buena con la computadora, como ya te he dado cuenta. Bueno, vale, voy a terminar las animaciones de la presentación. <ríe> eh, ¿Nos vemos a qué hora? Perdona, yo no me acuerdo. A las 5. En 20 minutos, a las 5. Ok, 20 minutos, listo. Buenísimo. Gracias, chao.
Hola. Hello. Hola Santiago. Hola. Ah, pensaba que no había nadie, me habían dejado solo. No, no veo a nadie. Ah, sí. <ríe> no, es que nadie se conectaba y... No te escucho. <ríe> Sí. Ah, no, no, no lo digo por ti, lo digo por, por los demás. Que, eh... Deben ser mis. No, no, está, está todo bien, está Un todo bien. segundo. No. Ah, ok. A ver, di algo. Hola. Sí, listo. Listo. Qué bueno. Vale. Bueno, listo. Eh, listo, preparado. Eh, ¿Puedes probar a compartir pantalla a ver si, si está? Sí, dame, dame un segundo, porque para hacer eso, yo tengo que mover todo, todo lo que está en mi escritorio. Esto de tenerlo. Porque la dificultad es que tengo como tres pantallas, entonces si estoy viendo esta y la cámara está aquí, parece que estoy ignorando a la gente. Es horrible. Yo tengo igual, te estoy viendo a ti aquí, pero tengo las otras cosas allí. Estoy viendo el correo aquí, el Slack Channel aquí y aquí tengo otra cosa. Sí, bueno, conoces mi problema, ¿verdad? Sí. Está bien. Pero bueno. Bueno, no importa, la gente se acostumbra ya. Después de un año y medio haciendo Zoom todos los días, alguien tiene que... A ver, vamos a poner esto en pantalla completa. Listo, y ahora no veo nada el Zoom, buenísimo. Aquí, y entonces esta la voy a poner del otro lado. Es complicado todo esto. Ajá, compartir. Esta. Listo. ¿Se ve? Perfecto. Pero lo que es muy curioso es que yo, una vez que yo hago eso, yo ya no los veo más nunca, no sé dónde están, no sé dónde hay nadie. Eh, no, como que en la pantallita pequeña, pequeña tienes ahí varias opciones. Sí, 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 sí ya, lo, ya te encontré. Ah, exactamente. O sea, sí. Creo que una es minimizar, otra aparece solo tú, supongo, y en otra aparece más, más gente. Sí, más gente. Sí, sí, sí. Listo. Y la que no tengo, por el contrario, ahora... Ay, qué fastidio esto. Ah, sí, sí la tengo. Sí. Ok, la de las preguntas. Sí. ¿Alguien pregunta? Ver, sí, está la, suerte, la suerte que tuve ayer. Eh, tú decides, te pregunto al final, te voy interrumpiendo porque... Hay no, preguntas. me puedes interrumpir. De todas maneras, yo tengo la, la ventana de las preguntas abiertas. Uh -huh. Y entonces, si alguien pregunta algo, yo... Vale, yo y las preguntas te las leo yo o las lees tú, porque hay, eh, aquí una, tuvimos una pequeña charla ahora con, entre los organizadores, porque los, hay algunos speakers que las preguntas se las leen para sí mismos. Sí, yo eh, tengo esa claro, mala costumbre. Eh, exactamente. Entonces, eh, pues sí. Maya dice que mejor... Eh... Sí, mejor léela tú, así. Vale, vale. Sí, porque si bueno. no yo estoy, empiezo a murmurar, empiezo y que... No, muy bonito. Vale, va, vamos, vamos a empezar, que Adolfo ya me está tirando Listo. las orejas. Así que eh, vamos allá. So, eh, hello everyone again. So we will resume operations and we'll continue with the last talk of the of the afternoon with uh, Rebecca Rivero Palau. So please, Rebecca, you can start and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so today is the second part of uh, this talk. Uh, just today we talk about monolayer graphing. Today we're going to talk about uh, bilayer graphing, which is just a slightly more complicated system, but uh, in, I believe to be a much richer uh, system. So first, I'm just gonna uh, summarize very quickly what we did yesterday. So yesterday we talked about uh, monolayer graphing, how to open an energy gap in monolayer graphing. We did this by aligning uh, boronitride and uh, graphing. 
we can see the signatures of uh, this alignment in the transport measurements. We can see it by two means. The first one is the appearance of a satellite peak. When the Fermi energy crosses the satellite peak in the Fermi in the energy band structure, and uh, also by the opening of an energy gap at the charge neutrality point and at the satellite peak. Uh, these measurements, as I told you yesterday, are 300 k, and that's why we don't see the opening of the energy gap. But if we go to low temperatures, and we do this for several alignments, we can uh, easily extract what's uh, the energy gap or uh, all the all the spectrum of alignments of graphene on, uh, on the end. So as I told you before, while the charge neutrality point uh, behaves a little bit, uh, let's say in an oscillatory fashion, uh, the satellite peak behaves uh, much uh, in a predictable way. It closes uh, far from alignment. It opens to its maximum at a full alignment. And it's this uh, energy gap and this breaking of inversion symmetry what uh, allow us to see the anomalous velocity generated by the very curvature. This very curvature in analogy, in analogy with the magnetic field can be viewed as a magnetic field, but this time in the momentum space. And it has, uh, as a consequence, an induced valley conductivity which in the case of monolayer, and only for monolayer graphene, it has a value that is quantized uh, inside the gap, uh, one Fermi energy is inside the energy gap, and it decreases very fast uh, away from the, from the energy gap or from the charge neutrality point. So unfortunately, this value hole uh, cannot be directly, it's not a direct observable, it cannot be measured directly, but we have other quantities as a non-local resistance that can be uh, measured uh, in just an experiment. And uh, the way we measure this non-local resistance is we apply a current in uh, these two leads, normally without the very curvature and without this uh, contribution of the valley hole uh, conductivity, the carrier should go straight from one electron to the other in the case of a breaking of inversion symmetry, an energy gap in a very curvature, uh, an important very curvature, we will have electrons or carriers going, uh, belonging to one valley going to one direction and the ones belong to the other valley going to the opposite direction. So this is called the valley hole effect. In the other side of our sample, we have the inverse <laughs> valley hole effect, which will create a charge accumulation in one of our electrodes, and that will be uh, the origin of our non-local signal. Uh, we also, just to recap very quickly, uh, we also saw some experiments performed by the Manchester group on this uh, subject where they use aligned and non-aligned samples to demonstrate that uh, it's really the presence of the energy gap that creates this uh, uh, non-local signals. Uh, they show that the ohmic contribution is very small, so this is not just uh, electrons or carriers going around uh, the sample because the electrons are uh, uh, far enough. And they also observe uh, this cubic relation, or uh, not directly but indirectly, this uh, cubic relation of the non-local resistance with the local uh, with the local resistance, and extrapolate uh, that. Uh, the non-local resistance, the dependence of their non-local resistance as a function of the length of the sample uh, will extrapolate at zero length to the quantum of, uh, of conductance, so two square over h, which is the value that we should observe uh, in this valley hole conductivity. Now, this, is, uh, this was the first work about it. Uh, later on, two groups, uh, a Japanese group and uh, a group at Cambridge University, uh, measure the same kind of, uh, they perform the same kind of experiments this time in higher quality uh, graphene because this graphene is fully encapsulated and uh, they observe what seems to be uh, the transport through ballistic channels. And in fact, uh, they, they claim to see a quantization of the resistance to 
two is square over h, uh, once again. And uh, this, this is the signature of uh, a conduction made uh, by edges, by, uh, by the edges of the, the sample. Uh, now, if you see this cubic relation between the non-local and the local resistance, which is, at the end of the day, one of the main tools we have to really distinguish topological uh, valley currents or uh, non-topological valley currents. In fact, uh, for low temperatures, a very low temperatures, these do not follow, their measurements do not follow this quadratic uh, relation, but as they increase the temperature, they start to see this uh, restitution of this uh, cubic, sorry, it's not quadratic, it's cubic relation. So this is a monolayer. So far, a uh, few experiments showing that uh, there is not a clear conclusion if this might be a, a bulk or an edge effect, but it seems to be that we are going somewhere in terms of uh, finally separating valley currents that might be used in, in future balletronics experiments. So today we're gonna uh, move just slightly uh, away from, uh, from that, we are still talking about valley topological currents. So we still have a system where we can open a gap, but it's a different system. In this case, we are talking about bilayer graphing. Uh, this is just AB or Bernal stack bilayer graphing. So standard, there is no twist between the two graphing uh, layers, okay? So we all know uh, bilayer graphing by now. We all know it's a band structure. By layer graphing, it's a, a very interesting system, uh, a subject that is very interesting uh, to me and that is, uh, let's say, also dear to my heart is the quantum hall effect and the different uh, uh, topological effects that you can observe. For example, in this case, we have, have even denominators that can only be observed in bilayer graphing or in monolayer graphing aligned with uh, poronitrite in very specific angles. Uh, this is just to, to show you that bilayer is in fact uh, one of the richest systems. We can have uh, very exotic states as these even denominators, fractional quantum hole states. Uh, we can have uh, a, a really uh, large solidity, solidity of uh, topological states uh, around. But uh, what concerns us today is how to open a gap in a bilayer graphic. So we know two ways to do this. We can either apply a displacement field uh, out of plane uh, electric field that will create an asymmetry between the two layers and it will open an energy gap. It has been already proved by ARPES, by electron transport, by every mean uh, possible in the world. And we can also uh, align bilayer graphene with poronitrite. And in this case has been predicted to have uh, a very interesting band structure. Uh, these are Koshino and Moon's uh, uh, numerical simulations of the subject a few years ago, but it's also been, uh, the numerical simulations has been reproduced recently uh, by an MIT group, uh, where they, in fact, they predict that uh, bilayer graphene, AB stack, bilayer graphene aligned with boronitride at zero alignment, it has the presence of uh, flat bands. And uh, there is even a paper claiming superconductivity in these systems, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about uh, today. I'm not gonna talk about that uh, today. I'm just talking about uh, the fact that uh, we can open an energy gap at the charge neutrality point and another gap at the Sarlai peak. So now uh, we have exactly the same effects when we break inversion symmetry in a monolayer or in a bilayer uh, graphing. So as I just told you before, we break inversion symmetry in bilayer graphing. Uh, this time, we have our uh, very curvature that will be different from zero as, uh, because we don't have inversion, uh, special inversion symmetry anymore. This very curvature will give rise to an anomalous velocity, which means that our electrons will move uh, away from a straight trajectory. Our carriers will move away uh, from our straight trajectory. 
And they, this very curvature is opposite depending on the valley that the carriers belongs to. So they will move uh, carriers belonging to K, will move in one direction, carriers belonging to K prime, they will move in the opposite direction, or so we think. Uh, sorry. And uh, as I just told you a few seconds ago, this will induce a whole uh, conductivity. In the case of uh, bilayer graphic, this whole conductivity will be different. It's uh, uh, because the uh, very face of uh, bilayer graphene is 2 pi instead of pi. In the case of graphene, this valley hole uh, conductivity, instead of being quantized to 2 square over h, as is the case of monolayer graphene, will be quantized to 4 e square over h. So once again, in, uh, in bilayer, the only tools that we have uh, to measure this, at least in transport, is a, a no direct measurement, a measurement of the non-local uh, resistance of the system. And uh, the phenomena in monolayer and bilayer are exactly the same. We will need the uh, valley hole and inverse valley hole effect to measure it. So the first results uh, concerning to that the, appear in the literature were in 2015 by a Japanese group uh, where they apply a displacement field. As I told you before, you can open the energy gap in two ways, apply a displacement field or uh, align with photonitrite. So in this case, they align, they align, sorry, they apply a displacement field. So as they increase this displacement field, you can see that the resistance at the charge neutrality point increases from uh, something very low, so they have about 20 uh, kilo ohms to 90 kilo ohms. This is a local measurement, okay? This is why uh, you can see it in this uh, drawing. At the same time, when they apply the same uh, range of displacement field, they can see a non-local resistance that is appearing at the same, uh, at the same moment as uh, we are uh, opening the gap and breaking the inversion symmetry. But you can notice the first thing is that our non-local resistance, it's a very high, it's a very high resistance. It goes up to 90 kilo ohms, while the non-local resistance, it's a very low. Uh, it only goes to about 60. 600, sorry, 600 uh, ohms. So the uh, direct relation between the opening of the energy gap and the observation of this non-local uh, resistance led you to think that uh, this might be uh, related to the breaking of uh, the inversion symmetry and the opening of this energy gap. And uh, in fact, uh, if you see, once again, the ohmic contribution of their local resistance, it's really negligible compared to the non-local resistance. It's in fact four orders of magnitude smaller for one of the highest displacement field they, they apply. So, okay, this is good. Non-local resistance, we can observe it, we can play with them. That's the, the very good uh, conclusion of, uh, of this. Uh, of this paper is the, the fact that we can activate or disactivate this non-local resistance. But are they topological? Well, they try to answer this question about uh, the topology in the same way as uh, in the monolayer with the cubic relation. In fact, they found a cubic relation if, when they look at the uh, non-local resistance as a function of the local resistance, they found this cubic relation that seems to be the signature or the ultimate signature that we have to uh, demonstrate that uh, a valley current or a non-local uh, uh, current, it's really topological. However, the first thing that you have to notice in, in this um, plot that is very important is that this cubic relation, it's only observed for very low displacement fields. So I, maybe this curve is a little bit um, difficult to understand in terms of what are we measuring here. So here they are just looking at this resistance and plotting this resistance versus this resistance 
for a given displacement field. So what it gives is that this is the low displacement field uh, regime, and this is the high displacement field regime. And you can see that the non-local resistance gets saturated in the high displacement field regime, where there is no uh, an apparent uh, reason for that. There is no uh, real change, or at least it's not expected by theory, uh, a change in this uh, behavior. Later on, uh, Marco Polini in Italy made some uh, calculations uh, that might lead to the origin of this uh, saturation, but uh, it's still to in under debate because it doesn't match completely the, the experimental data. So, okay, they they made a beautiful experiment. They can tune uh, Bali topological currents. Let's say that at least in this regime, we can believe that they have uh, topological currents. We don't understand very well what happens after that, but they seem to to be still in the topological uh, part. Then the second group uh, was working on the same subject exactly at the same time, apparently, uh, they published back to back, and uh, they got basically the same results, uh, still this cubic relation that we are gonna see one over and over again. Uh, okay, so valid topological currents, uh, but the main question here is, are these uh, topological currents that propagate through the bulk or do they propagate uh, through the edge of the sample? If they are really topologically protected, uh, we can have uh, both types of uh, topological uh, protection. It depends on, uh, on the bands of, uh, of your system. So they did what I consider it's a very clever uh, experiment. They measure non-local resistance as a function of, of the gate, so as a function of uh, the density of the system. So they apply a uh, current through middle of this device, and then they measure the non-local resistance in one side and the other side of the sun. And here you can see the left side and the right side, they have basically the same non-local resistance. So what's the point of this experiment and why I consider it so beautiful? If this was an uh, edge effect, if this was uh, an edge topological current, then the valley currents will have to go all around these very long arms that are not connected. This will mean that their amplitude, the left and right amplitude will be much different because, much different because the uh, valley topological uh, currents decay exponentially with length. In this case, they found uh, about the same uh, value of, uh, of resistance, which uh, means that, in fact, the propagation, it's only on the bulk. So, okay, every, uh, every step of the way, we learn something new about these topological currents. Let's say that, okay, they follow a cubic relation, so we are in what we can uh, say it's a topological regime. Now we know that they seem to propagate on the, on the bulk uh, of the material. They are not edge topological currents, which is also uh, a new information. Then a new group, uh, another Japanese group in uh, uh, Japan, <laughs> did uh, another experiment uh, this time uh, using graphene, uh, bilayer graphene aligned with boronitrite. And well, this hasn't been done before, but it should give you, uh, in principle, as the origin of this uh, berry curvature and uh, of this breaking of inversion symmetry and berry curvature is the same, you should have exactly the same uh, response as in the one aligned uh, with the displacement field, sorry. So they just performed the same kind of experiment, non-local experiments in H bars. They observe uh, what they claim to be the valley hole effect and the inverse valley hole effect. And it's pretty much the same as uh, the other uh, papers. So we have strong non-local resistance. We have a cubic relation again, but once again, this cubic relation, it's last with uh, this time with temperature, previous time was uh, with displacement field, making a stronger displacement field. And this time it's, uh, it's just lost 
with temperature, which is kind of a, of a puzzle. So in, in terms of uh, when we are talking about graphing a line with Vn, uh, if you remember uh, the talk yesterday, we have to be very careful about the, the alignment between the layers because it's, uh, this angular alignment changed a lot the electronic band structure and it changed a lot uh, your periodic potential. So it might also affect your topological curves. So that's why we decide to perform the same kind of experiments by layer graphing align with boron nitride. Just at this time, uh, well, the aim of our uh, work was to make sure we are in a fully aligned position. So sorry. To make sure we are in a fully aligned position, we took uh, devices that we know how to build. These are dynamically rotatable van der Waals heterostructures structures where we have a whole bar made of graphene. This is exposed graphene. And we cap these uh, whole bars with an hexagonal boronitride layer. And we move, we change the alignment of this uh, boronitride layer just by using an atomic force microscope. So this is the real picture of our device. What we do uh, in this case is just perform some experiments at 300K where we are gonna continuously, we are gonna change the alignment uh, and perform transport measurements until we find the fully aligned position. So now if you remember yesterday's experiment at 300K, we could see the satellite peaks in monolayer graphene, which made uh, our life much <laughs> better, much simpler. In the case of bilayer graphene, it's not at all the case. Even when we are uh, fully aligned, we cannot really see a signature farther than that, a strong broadening of this uh, direct peak. And even though uh, to distinguish between uh, very small angles and from temperature is uh, very complicated. So we decided to be uh, as aligned as we could and go down in temperature where we can really uh, see this uh, satellite peak. We perform this experiment for different uh, alignments, we calculate the Moray wavelengths uh, from, from the position of the satellite peaks in, uh, in voltage. And in fact, we were very happy because uh, we are able to change this Moray lens, uh, even in bilayer graphing, in a very reproducible way. We, we were very happy we place ourselves in uh, the highest or the more aligned position. That's what well, the title of this is, uh, topological balikarant seem fully aligned by layer graphing. So we are very sure of our angle. We are very sure that we have the, the highest uh, degree of alignment that we can uh, achieve. So we went to low temperatures. We started at 10K just to test, uh, first to test our alignment and then to test our non-local measurements. Turns out non-local measurements are uh, quite difficult to do because it's a very, very small signal. Uh, nevertheless, we manage uh, with a little bit of effort. So here on the first curve, you can see our local resistance as a function of, uh, of the gate of the Fermi energy. We have a very strong direct peak and uh, small satellite peaks that can be seen a little bit better in this uh, zooming of the curve. So we also have here in red, the non-local resistance and uh, the non-local ohmic resistance, which is just uh, using a van der Poel calculation of the ohmic uh, contribution to, the, to this uh, non-local signal. So we can see that the ohmic uh, signal is very small, very low, which is very good because that means that our non-local signal is real, is there, and it's uh, it's coming uh, from the sample and not just or for, uh, from the opening of this energy gap and not just uh, from electrons or carriers being scattered back and forth. So we did uh, we can see that uh, around the charge neutrality point is the same behavior around the satellite peaks. I'm not showing it 
here just because it's uh, it's going to be very confusing having a black line in the middle. So here it's where uh, where the fun starts, let's say, or yeah, or where we think the fun starts. So in if you remember from previous uh, measurement, the non-local resistance was always follow, following very well the behavior of the local resistance, but it's not at all the case in in our uh, in our samples. In fact. For the charge neutrality point, yes, it's following very well the behavior of uh, the charge neutrality point. However, for the satellite peaks, we're having a negative non-local resistance. The same uh, for the second satellite peak, we are having also a dip after the peak. So we start, of course, as an experimentalist, we start wondering maybe we are not measuring this. Uh, in the right way, we perform these experiments using uh, almost every instrument uh, available to measure this. And uh, we figured out that, in fact, uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's a measurement. It's uh, in, in reality, the non-local signal here in red, it's really changing its sign as we pass through uh, the charge, uh, through the satellite peak. And it's also having a dip in the charge neutrality point and having also a, a change in sign in the second satellite. We, we start wondering maybe we are not at fully aligned and maybe we have a, a mix of angles. Uh, maybe we are just miscalculating our angle. So we perform some magnetotransport uh, measurements to extract the, a very accurate value of lambda of the Moria wavelengths, which is uh, for us 14.4 nanometers, with so which means that we are at zero degrees at the highest uh, at the highest alignment possible. Uh, we can see, of course, that this is a an aligned system. We can see Hofstad butterfly effects where we have uh, the replicas of the lambda fans uh, at the two sides of the main lambda fan interfering with each other. And from these uh, brown oscillations, it's where we extract this uh, gap, which uh, goes very well with the calculation uh, of just taking the density where the satellite peak appears. So now, okay, uh, this seems uh, seems to be what we are looking for. So let's uh, let's see what happens. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I went in the wrong direction. Uh, so we performed some local measurements uh, just to characterize our sample. Uh, we only see one energy gap at the charge neutrality point. This is a log scale. Okay, please pay attention to that. Uh, we extract the activation gap at the charge neutrality point. Turns out to be a very small uh, energy gap. It's about the half of what was predicted by Moon in Koshina. We do not see any uh, energy gap at the satellite peaks. So we don't see this secondary gap. We can see that uh, this local resistance comes in two regimes, comes in a, in a thermally activated regime, which kind of stops or stops around uh, 16 Kelvin and uh, after the lower temperatures than 16 Kelvin, we can see uh, more of a hoping regime. So it's a much slower, a much um, yeah, slower uh, regime. So, okay, well, we have an energy gap. We can, uh, we can have some uh, very curvature. And uh, here we measure the, we measure the non-local resistance to see uh, what is its evolution. So the first thing that uh, was very encouraging to us to tell us that uh, this change in the non-local resistance, strong change in the non-local resistance was not just an experimental uh, problem, is the fact that you can see a very well, uh, very clear dependence on temperature. In fact, you can see it, uh, you can see that there are different regimes, a regime where you have a negative uh, resistance, a negative non-local resistance, a regime where you have a positive, just positive non-local resistance. Here, it's also maybe a little bit uh, more difficult to see, but you have the same effect. In this case, it's a little bit opposite because 
this shoulder of the resistance just gets flattened and then it increases and uh, and the one in the electron side behaves a little bit different it only uh, reduces its size in both uh, directions so well let's uh, let's see how it behaves because this behavior is no so clear it's not so easy to understand so we decided to go for something that we know first as a first step and uh, we start measuring just the charge neutrality point to begin with so when we measure the the thermal activation or how is the behavior of this thermal uh, of this non local conductance as a function of the temperature we can find two regimes so we found a first regime with an energy gap of about 48 kelvins. And at about 40 K, we have a change, strong change in the, in the behavior with a gap that seems to be larger. Uh, and uh, that stops again at 16 K. And after 16 K, we have the same behavior as uh, in the local resistance, just hopping. So very, very slow uh, decrease on the resistance, on the conductance, sorry. So, well, but this do not say much about the topological currents. But if we take the previous curve, if we take this non-local, this local resistance and this non-local resistance, of course, what we were very tempted to do is plot local versus non-local and see if we have a cubic relation. And uh, in fact, that's the case. Uh, we can see uh, about the same behavior as for bilayer with a, an applied displacement field. We can see that we have a saturation regime where the just uh, the non-local resistance do not change anymore, and a, a, a very clear and very well defined uh, non-local resistance depending as the cube uh, yes power of three with a cubic relation of the local resistance. And then a second part of this uh, curve, which seems to be quadratic. So the first, uh, the first question is, what is happening here? Why do we have uh, three regimes? So last time we saw a paper about bilayer, there was only two. Now we are having the three regimes. What are these three regimes about and how can they uh, help me to understand what is happening around the satellite peaks? So for that, what we, uh, what we can say about that is uh, the following. If we plot just uh, the temperature dependence of the non-local resistance, in a very, uh, let's say, smooth uh, map. And we also make very clear where are our uh, uh, different regimes. We observe two things. In the first, in the higher part, from 40 kelvins up, we do not really see any behavior that is strange to us. We only see a non-local resistance. We always see, uh, this is uh, maybe something uh, very important that I forgot to mention before. Uh, we always see a non-local resistance, even at uh, 300K. And uh, the importance of this comes uh, from the fact that if we can see this non-local resistance up to high temperatures, and if the origin it's, uh, it's topological if uh, this signal is at 300K is really coming from the opening of the energy gap. This opens a, a clear way to future applications in, uh, in bioelectronics. It's why it's so uh, important, let's say, to observe this uh, up to high temperature. Anyway, so we can see that uh, there are no non-local uh, resistance. And even at high temperature, we can observe this uh, non-local resistance, at least a non-local signal that is quite strong, especially at uh, the charge neutrality point. Here, this curve has been cut just for the sake of clarity to see uh, these two peaks uh, better. But this non-local resistance, in fact, uh, I think there is a question. Santiago, 
Yes, there is a question in this plot. Do we know roughly about KBT, how KBT compares to the size of the energy gap? I, I, I mean, here it's, well, you have, so thanks for the, for the question. The first thing is, uh, it seems that we have two energy gaps. So it seems that the gap of the, of the local, given by the local resistance, uh, it's something about 22K, okay? And the gap of the non-local resistance, it's much greater than that. This was exactly the same case uh, for the first bilayer measurements. They observed the same, they observed a gap in the non-local resistance that is much stronger than the gap of the, uh, of the local resistance. And this is just attributed to uh, impurities. So in the non-local resistance, you are less prone or less sensitive to disorder and inhomogeneities in your sample. And that's believed to be the origin of uh, having a better resolution in your, uh, in your energy gap, not necessarily having a larger energy gap, but uh, a better resolution, a better way to extract your energy gap. That's the, that's the accurate uh, way to say it. Uh, so uh, about your question, how no, roughly KVT compares to the size of the energy gap. I, I'm not sure that I understand where do you want to go uh, with that question. So I might be a, it might be a little bit uh, difficult for me to, to answer. Uh, what I would like to, to say or to add to this is that in at least uh, in if you want to compare the temperature that we have to the temperature of uh, these two gaps, it's a little bit, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't have quite the right words to say this, but uh, let's say that 70K, if you want to compare 70K here, we don't see any special effects, uh, neither to 22 neither to 22K, but I don't think that's the right way to, to do it, comparing the gaps with uh, the temperature in, uh, in this uh, system right now. But nevertheless, uh, what I was saying. So, okay, uh, we have these two uh, temperatures where uh, we observe, from which we observe changes in the behavior, okay? and we have a cubic relation in between these two, 12 and 40K. If we plot uh, roughly where they are, uh, 12, uh, 12 and 40K, we can say many things about uh, the system. For example, this uh, dip in the non-local resistance uh, that we saw from the beginning that I have been talking about uh, for a long time, in fact, it develops uh, for temperatures lower than 40K, you can see it here in blue. It starts developing for those temperatures and for temperatures lower than uh, 12 Kelvin is where we can start to see this second minimum in the, uh, this second dip in the non-local resistance. So it seems to be a, a clear relation uh, between the range in which we can observe this uh, cubic relation, the range in energy or in temperature that we can observe this cubic relation and the appearance of these uh, uh, dips in the non-local resistance of the satellite peaks and the charge neutrality point. Now, if you see it, maybe this will be a, too much of a hand wave uh, argument, but I, I'm just looking for a good uh, design. I forgot to put in the, in the last part. So if, if you think that uh, this is a picture that we are having, okay? We inject electrons in this side, okay? Electrons going with one valley will go to the right, going with the opposite valley will go to the left. And then we have a charge accumulation in this side, okay? And we are measuring just a regular voltage. The way we measure voltage uh, in these systems is this voltage minus this voltage that gives you your signal because one of them will always be the reference. 
Now, this is what happens if you inject electrons, but if you inject holes, the opposite will happen. And that's exactly, so the, when I say the opposite will happen is that your charge accumulation will be in this electrode, which means that your non-local signal will be inverted. And that's exactly what is happening here. We're having an inversion of the non-local, of our non-local resistance. So this is just a change in the char carrier uh, nature, uh, which is expected, which is also what we see at the charge neutrality point. Now the question, the real question that we haven't solved uh, so far and that we unfortunately don't have a, a good answer for uh, yet, it's so why this dip is not more pronounced if we are injecting electrons and, uh, and holes in the, same, in the same way, why this is not more symmetric. Maybe we will need to go to lower temperature to solve that question. We don't know yet, but uh, it seems pretty clear to us that we can explain where, uh, what's the origin of this non-local uh, resistance, negative non-local resistance. This might be a, a real proof of this uh, chirality dependent non-local uh, resistance. At full alignment, we also need to, to know what happens to other alignments. Uh, but so far, we are uh, very happy and, uh, and uh, very, uh, I don't know what's the word in English, but uh, let's say that we are very happy to, to recover uh, a dependence that, sorry, a dependence of uh, a cubic dependence of the non-local resistance and uh, to be able to explain this uh, negative non-local uh, resistance. So with that, I would like just to thank you for your attention. I know I went a little bit fast, but uh, <laughs> I mean, when you are online, it's very difficult to control the time for me. So sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, let me see if there are questions in the Q and A box. There are no questions here. I think. So. Yeah, I actually have a couple of questions. Can I ask you? Sure. Yeah. So one is a more technical one. How do you change the local resistance to measure the no local resistance? Uh, it's I mean, you, just you, the. You have yeah. a device, right? Just one device, and in that device you change the local and you measure the non-local. Yeah, so it's uh, for the moment it's just a manual system. So these devices they go this at low temperature. So you have lines that go to high temperature, and uh, at high temperature you just have uh, pins to connect, mm -hmm. and uh, you just have to change how what's your configuration. It's a uh, it's just disconnecting wires and reconnecting. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the local resistance, I mean, it's just a function of the length of the... Your no, no, no. So local and non-local. Uh, maybe this is not the best um, a picture to show that. Uh, I think I might have uh, one that is much better in, uh, let's say, this one. Okay. So uh, local it will mean that you apply the current here, mm -hmm. drain it here, and measure between these two. This means that uh, your voltage drop is across a section where the current is flowing. Mm -hmm. Okay? While the non-local, it means that uh, the flow of carriers, it's far away from uh, the place where you are measuring. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the difference between uh, these two, it will be only which electrodes you use to inject and which electrons you use to measure your, your voltage. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. And the other question is somehow something, uh, or I am lost in this uh, topological summary school and twisted things. Um, do you think that phonons play a role in all of this uh, low energy physics? I mean, or you expect some kind of a phonon effect in the, uh, depending on the twisting between one uh, and the other? Because you, you, you showed a lot of change yeah. in this non-local resistance as a function of temperature. Yes. Uh, I don't know if uh, some other- Well, uh, it depends on, on uh, 
I mean, I, I'm not sure that, uh, that that the temperatures that we are uh, measuring for us will uh, play a role. And especially, I'm not sure that they will uh, impact this uh, local or non-local uh, measurements. Or, or uh, what I'm trying to say is I'm not sure that they will impact your uh, topological uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. There is... Uh, probably a phonon contribution at higher uh, temperatures, but uh, at the temperatures where we are measuring at 10K, there is uh, for sure no more contribution of phonons in, uh, in graphene. The, the, maybe the question is a little bit more uh, complex of that because it's uh, phonons on graphene, no, but phonons maybe on hexagonal boron nitride or uh, even maybe on the more super lattice when graphene and the they are completely aligned. You have uh, one system, uh, the graphene is stretched. So maybe you can find some phonon contribution there, but I'm not sure that it will be, that it, it will give you a, a real signal to measure a, in this particular experiment. Okay. There is a question in the Q&A. Uh, can the asymmetry between the positive and negative uh, RNL, so I think it's non-local resistance. Non-local resistance. Yeah, non-local resistance. Be partially related to a different effective mass of electrons and holes. Uh, mm, yes. Uh, that could be uh, something to look into. Uh, but but uh, I think they are not that uh, different for uh, well at, at least not in the numerical uh, in the numerical simulations they don't look uh, that different but uh, for sure it's something to look into uh, in I mean it's something uh, to look into in terms of uh, we could measure the effective mass this effective mass uh, will affect our valley semen uh, splitting and uh, this is something. Uh, it, this is something that should, I think it should be symmetric about, uh, around. I mean, I think the masses are symmetric, but I'm not sure. It's, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. It's uh, definitely something to, to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And no more questions. Let me check this last one. Uh, there is nothing for you. Yeah, so I think, uh, thank you again, Rebecca, for being with Sandia. us this week. And uh, I think there, yeah. there's a question, uh, but... Uh, uh, yeah. I, no, 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 I, no, it works. I, I have a, a last question, if, uh, if I'm allowed. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, it's a curiosity, actually, like uh, when you show this, yeah. it's a very nice uh, system where you can rotate your top mm -hmm. layer for a nitride, right? And um, you do it with the FMT, right? Yes. You do it by applying force or by applying voltage? Force. Force. We push. Uh, we push in these little arms. In fact, I I took this picture that is not the best because the handle is not completely on top of the whole bar, just because uh, after you push, uh, you damage a little bit the arms. So it's not as beautiful. <laughs> that's uh, just a cosmetic uh, thing. Uh, but that's all what we are doing. We're just uh, pushing, literally just pushing with the AFM. Yeah, and that's an AFM picture, right? So yes. So I guess you can. You need to control the force you use for imaging, and and then you need to apply some extra one to to shift to, to rotate. So. Uh, yes. The, so the technique is it's quite simple. So in principle. Uh, you just have to push, and if your if your force is enough, it will uh, it will move. Uh, the trick in here is that uh, what does it mean that your force is enough? Because uh, the friction forces between these materials increase uh, when they are aligned. When they are close to alignment, they increase. So what is a little bit tricky to do is finding this uh, like the good positions, like here. Like uh, making a very small change between two of these is, uh, is, can be very tricky because uh, the force that you need might be uh, too high. Uh, so when you try to go there, you just move it too much or you just pass off the other side. So it's a long experiment. 
uh, to select the good angles, but it, yeah, it, it's just a matter of getting used to it, I guess. All right, thank you. No more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for being here this week with us. Thank and you. I hope to see you next year in here in San Sebastian. Sure. Let's, let's see if the, the pandemic allows us to, to do this in Life. Yeah, life in here in San Sebastian. And so with uh, Rebecca in this last talk of the afternoon, we close the session and we encourage everyone to meet up again next Monday with a new lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, yeah, Monday at 2.30 European time. So thank you very much again and see you. Ciao. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.